Okay, we'll declare the meeting open to the, the public. First, can I welcome uh, Gemma Dolan to the Committee uh, for Justice and uh, for members uh, benefit a copy of uh, her entry in the Register of Members' Interests is included in the, the table pack uh, for noting. Uh, just to read out the statement, uh, obviously you're aware of the uh, changes that have been made to Assembly procedures, so members will be aware that from 9pm on Wednesday the 18th of March 2020, the Speaker and the Assembly Commission has restricted access to the building to essential business users only. This means that the general public will not be permitted access to the building and to the public galleries in the Chamber and Committees. Subject to the usual procedures in relation to closed sessions, any public sessions of the Committee will continue to be broadcast live for the public to view. Whilst this is not ideal, the Speaker and the Assembly Commission has taken this decision in the interests of public safety safety and procedures will continue to be reviewed on a daily basis. Okay, so most of the meeting members is going to take place in public session. Uh, there may be an element of it that will be held in closed session for members to get um, some more uh, details in respect to the uh, coronavirus uh, briefing. So if uh, members are content, uh, when appropriate, we'll have an element of that briefing in closed session. If members are agreed. 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 Just remind members, your mobile devices, um, if you can do the needful. Um, we'll have the oral evidence sessions on domestic abuse bill, and also uh, there are two legislative consent motions, uh, which will be reported by Hansard, and I would seek your agreement to do this. I'll speak to one of those LCMs later that I intend to get the committee's agreement to defer to a future meeting after speaking with the vice chairman uh, of the uh, committee, and I'll, I'll handle that uh, when it arises. With apologies from uh, Linda Dillon, deputy chairperson, and also uh, Emma Rogan, um, and with no other apologies that we need to note. Item two is just the draft minutes of the meeting that's held on the 12th of March, and there are pages five to 10 of your meeting pack, and if you're content that they're a true reflection, then I will sign them accordingly. Members are agreed. Thank you. Okay, some matters arising. Um, changes to the Access NI filtering scheme, pages 12 to 15 of your um, meeting pack. And the committee considered the correspondence from the department advising of changes the minister intended to make from the 16th of March, initially on an administrative basis, to the Access NI disclosure process to prevent further challenges following a Supreme Court ruling which was included in the table pack at last week's meeting. The Minister has removed the multiple conviction rule, which she believes will achieve the element of proportionality that the Court considered was missing from the process. The change in policy will have a significant impact on the criminal record information now disclosed. However, the Minister does not consider that the safeguarding of vulnerable groups will be compromised by this change. The Minister will bring forward the relevant secondary legislation, which will be subject to the affirmative procedure as soon as possible to provide the Committee and the Assembly the appropriate level of scrutiny. Um, it was agreed that the correspondence would be included under matters arising for this meeting in order to give members adequate time to properly identify any issues for further information that is required at this stage prior to consideration of the relevant secondary legislation. So, if members are uh, content to note the Minister's position, um, and obviously we will deal with the secondary legislation in more detail when it comes to the Committee, uh, unless there are other issues that members want clarity from now, then we will note the information. Noted. Um, next item is just a memo from uh, the Committee Chairs for, from the Speaker of the House and the Committee Forward Work Programme. The memo from the Speaker to the Chairpersons of all statutory committees regarding the position in relation to Assembly business and current public health situation. Um, as members will have noted from the earlier statement, the Commission um, took the decision to close Parliament buildings to the public from 9pm yesterday. Uh, that has meant that there is no public tours, events, visitor activities taking place, and members of the public not permitted into Parliament buildings until further notice. Permanent Assembly pass holders and those essential to the delivery of Assembly business will continue to have access to the building as required. And for the purposes of committees, this will include witnesses. Uh, this decision is designed to respond to the current circumstances while ensuring that the Assembly can continue to carry out its political and legislative responsibilities at this time. Uh, the Speaker has indicated that it is for individual committees to determine their own business, um, but has suggested that all committees will want to consider balancing the need for continuing scrutiny 
with circumstances that uh, we are with. There will be a chairperson's uh, liaison uh, meeting next week, which I intend to take part in, and that might provide uh, a way forward for a consistent approach to be taken across all committees, and I will re uh, report on that at the uh, next meeting of the committee when that takes place. There is a written briefing on a proposal for an LCM for sentencing, and that has been included in today's agenda for the meeting at the request of the Department. The briefing on the draft Department of Justice Corporate and Business Plan has also been rescheduled until the meeting on the 2nd of April due to ongoing pressures across the Department uh, due to the contingency planning around the coronavirus. Um, the Department has also indicated that there is a comprehensive written briefing on EU exit and justice related issues that will be provided for the meeting on the 26th of March and an oral evidence session is due to be scheduled following uh, the Easter recess. So, In respect of the Forward Work Programme members, uh, given the circumstances uh, that we are in, um, I, I wanted to seek agreement from members that items on the Work Programme for the rest of March uh, are uh, postponed and the Committee uh, would only meet to consider urgent items of business. And that would include further briefings relating to the coronavirus, if required, and any other legislative matters, including LCMs or matters that are time bound. So that would deal with the issue in March, and obviously uh, we can reflect on the future work programme of the committee hereafter, if members are content. Um, the LCM on an emergency uh, coronavirus bill may also be tabled this week for debate in the Assembly next week, potentially on Tuesday. Um, and so I'm seeking members' agreement that uh, we would schedule an additional meeting of this committee uh, to enable uh, the committee to be briefed on any justice-related provisions prior to the debate taking place if the LCM is tabled. So if members are content, I'll call a meeting. Uh, it could be at short notice. It may well be on Monday. Uh, but it would give us the opportunity to consider uh, the justice-related element before the uh, debate in the Assembly. Um, so, if members are content... When uh, is the debate, sorry, Chair? The LCM on the provisions contained within the coronavirus legislation is being on tabled. On Tuesday? It could be on Tuesday. It, it, uh, it, it hasn't been confirmed. Been yeah, We're Tuesday. waiting on Westminster to, to act. It would have been helpful if we could have fitted it all in on Tuesday, but maybe it was two days, is it? Uh, in terms of this meeting? Yeah, have a, have a quick meeting on Tuesday sometime. Well, if we're able to have it on Monday, we'll do it on Monday to give us the time to, to get the detail on it. Um, okay. Um, <coughs> in terms of uh, the department has also indicated, sorry, that the Secretary of State for Health and Social Care has made a statement under Section 19.1a of the Human Rights Act that provisions in the bill are compatible with the Convention rights and provisions relating to the functions of the Department of Justice are aligned with the approach that is being taken across all other United Kingdom uh, jurisdictions. Okay. Next item is the uh, briefing from the Department. Um, the Committee considered a request from officials last week to provide an oral briefing um, at its meeting to do with the Department's coronavirus planning and discussions and preparations that are being taken across the justice system. The Committee agreed that as much of the session as possible should take place in public uh, before we move into closed session to deal with any areas or issues that can't uh, be covered in the public session. Uh, the Committee had also indicated that we would wish to have the Minister to attend the briefing if available. As the purpose of the briefing is to provide assurances on the practical and logistical preparations being made, the Minister was of the view that it is appropriate for lead officials to attend. Um, she is, however, happy to meet with the Committee in due course, should the need arise as the situation unfolds. So We will manage this with uh, two officials coming to the table in the first instance, and then we shall rotate. So Initially, we are going to have Deborah Brown and uh, Ronnie Armour. Members, then, once we get the initial overview, um, I will open it up to members to ask uh, questions. And, um, where some questions aren't able to dealt with, the witnesses will indicate, and then we'll deal with that in the uh, closed session. So let me welcome Deborah Brown, Director of the Justice Delivery Directorate within the Department of Justice, and also Ronnie Elmer, Director General of the Northern Ireland uh, Prison Service. So the meeting's being recorded by Hansard, and I'm going to. Right, okay. Um, uh, and I'll hand over to yourselves at this stage to give us a briefing. Okay, thank you, thank Chair. You.
So thank you to the committee um, for accommodating um, this afternoon's meeting. I'd like to thank my colleagues for their support this afternoon in providing the briefing. Ronnie Ormer, the Director General of Prisons, Peter Looney, Chief Executive of the Court Service, and from PSNI, ACC, Alan Todd. You'll all be aware of the continuing evolving situation, and we have been taking action in the DOJ to manage this. This is a societal crisis, and all of government and all of society need to work together to mitigate its impact. Our priority is to ensure the safety of our staff and to maintain essential services. We all understand the fears and uncertainties people face given the risks to their health, to their loved ones and to their livelihoods. The situation continues to evolve, but we remain resolute in ensuring we are doing all that we can to manage this. In DOJ, we have developed plans which identify the key services that we need to continue to deliver, the risks and how we will attempt to mitigate them. This process is a dynamic one. We have to take account of the advice to the public by the health authorities and what is actually happening on the ground. We've been looking at a reasonable worst case scenario and today is an opportunity for us to provide the Justice Committee with assurance on the approach being taken and that we are working collaboratively across the justice system to ensure that we are managing the risks in a joined up way and in full knowledge of the interdependencies and impact of a decision taken in one part of the justice system on another part. Significant work has already been done across the justice system and contingency plans are in place and we will continue to follow PHA guidance and advice. You'll also be aware that the UK government is introducing legislation today which is designed to help cope with some aspects of this crisis. It will include provision to allow more court business to be done remotely, either by video or audio, and to provide some extra powers in relation to burials. I'll now outline the steps that we are taking across the Justice family and also provide an assessment of the most significant risks faced by the justice system. My colleagues will then provide some additional information on their individual areas. So moving firstly to the action that we are taking. The wider Justice family is working together to mitigate any risks and ensure the continued delivery of justice in Northern Ireland. Business continuity plans are in place across the department's business areas, its agencies and its non-departmental public bodies. In addition, the department has an emergency response plan and the previous work on Brexit, including C3, coordinate, command and control, means that the department is well prepared for the challenges ahead. And we have now opened our departmental operations centre. The business continuity plans are designed to ensure that the organisations are prepared for events that threaten normal business. The three areas that are usually covered are people, accommodation and technology. These plans have been reconsidered in light of the current threat presented by the coronavirus and specifically the availability of staff. As you appreciate, the justice system is wide and complex Actions in one area will impact on several other areas. A coronavirus readiness meeting was first held on the 10th of March to understand the preparedness and risks across the justice system. This included representation across the department, its agencies, prisons, forensic science, legal service agency, the courts and youth justice agency, together with the PSNI, probation board and the PPS. The main focus of the meeting was to understand the key risks that are being managed, to understand the linkages needed across the organisations and identify were decisions which fall outside the justice system which might have an impact on us, and also to identify any areas where priority action is needed as a result. This forum is now in regular contact to ensure there is a common understanding of the challenges, the plans to manage the risks and the implications across the justice system. We're now having daily conference calls to keep abreast of developments 
and understand the actions that are being taken across the organisations. The Department also ran a business continuity desktop exercise on the 12th of March, which focused on the availability of staff. And this, again, has helped to inform the actions that we have taken. In light of the Prime Minister's announcement on Monday, we have now taken additional actions. You will be aware of the latest advice from the UK Government on the coronavirus. And this advice relates to social distancing, measures to help reduce the transmission of the disease. We have therefore asked individuals displaying symptoms to stay at home. We are also reducing non-essential social contact, particularly for those in vulnerable groups. People have been asked to work from home where possible, to limit the use of public transport and to avoid unnecessary social gatherings. For those who are working in the office, we are taking every action to enable physical distancing within the office, including trying to reconfigure seating arrangements to allow for a distance of two metres apart. We've also recommended that meetings should not take place unless absolutely essential, and to use telephone and ICT to avoid face-to-face -face meetings. We have asked that we all continue to maintain the highest possible personal hygiene, including washing our hands thoroughly and frequently. As an NICS, we must continue to deliver our essential work and services to the public, and therefore we are prioritising the work across the department and looking to how we can ensure we can redeploy resources to the most critical areas. I'll provide you now with the summary of our assessment of the key risks in justice. Under the reasonable worst case scenario, the justice system would continue to deal with the highest priority issues to maintain public safety, but are likely to need to stop work of a lower priority. We all appreciate the sensitivities involved in planning for potential scenarios for the coronavirus. While we are all aware of what has happened in other countries, we cannot know with certainty what will happen here. In scoping the scenarios, we do not want to create additional anxiety or a sense that these scenarios would materialise, but we must of course be as prepared as we can be in this uncertain environment. In justice terms, one of the most challenging areas will be prisons. Under the reasonable worst case scenario, the priority of the prison service will be to keep safe those people placed in their care. We anticipate a significant impact on the purposeful activity and the level of regime the service will be able to offer. While there are currently no confirmed cases within our prisons, the committee will understand the challenges a confirmed case will present in a custodial environment. More widely under this scenario, the justice system would focus on minimising harm and addressing vulnerability. While high priority work would continue, this would mean that lower priority services, including calls for service of less serious crimes, may not receive prompt responses. Similar reductions in service would also apply to supervision of those on community sentences using a risk-based approach. You'll be aware that the Lord Chief Justice issued clear guidance on the 17th of March, including in respect of courts to minimise the number of people who need to attend, to postpone future jury trials while seeking to finish those already in train, and to prioritise the most urgent business. Were this worst case scenario to be exceeded, these issues would be magnified across the board and would reduce a wider range of services, including those provided by police and courts. The difficulties faced would be greater were there to be a concentration of cases in areas where there are scarce specialist resources, which are critical to service delivery. And this could apply to a range of areas within the justice system. Finally, we are working with partners to prepare for the risk that normal burial arrangements will come under pressure. Every effort will be made to ensure that families and their deceased will be treated with dignity. I'll now pass across to Ronnie. Thank you, Deborah.
Chairman, before I brief the committee, can I first of all pay tribute to prison staff and our many partners for the work they have done in preparation for the challenges that lie ahead. We as an organisation are well used to facing complex and difficult situations, but the scale of what uh, we now face is unprecedented and will undoubtedly stretch the service beyond anything imaginable. It is important that we recognise that prison officers are key workers and one of the cr uh, critical services that society is now depending on. I am grateful to our staff and partners for their support in delivering the Minister's objective to maintain a normal regime for as long as possible. This is undoubtedly the right thing to do, but will in the days ahead become increasingly difficult. Today we have 1,601 individuals in our care, 1,045 of whom are adult males, 81 females, 89 are young men at Hydebank Wood, and 77 are over 60 years of age. This is an increase in 141 in our population on the 19th of March last year. I say this to provide the committee with a context as to the scale of the challenge we face. To this point, we continue to operate uh, an unrestricted regime, although the number of purposeful activity places <coughs> available has been reduced. Visits are still in place, and it is right that I acknowledge the extensive cleaning work that is being undertaken on a daily basis by staff and prison orderlies across the prison estate. <coughs> I have visited each of our prisons this week. And while both staff and prisoners are understandably concerned, morale is good. While some prisoners are asking family members not to visit, there is still a very significant demand for visits. Increasingly, there is a recognition that just as in the outside world, difficult decisions will have to be taken in the prison context. In, term of our pre in terms of our preparations, we have been guided throughout by the advice from the Public Health Agency, and we have been working very closely with our health care partners from the South Eastern Trust. In summary, we have been focused on firstly ensuring the right structure is in place to facilitate the effective operational planning and implementation that we must undertake, two, communicating effectively with staff and those in our care. Three, making extensive practical arrangements. Four, ensuring that we can support our staff in the context of what will be expected from them as dedicated, resilient, hard-working public servants. Five, ensuring we can support those in our care and mitigate as far as we reasonably can the inevitable impact on them. And finally, carefully planning a series of incremental operational developments to facilitate the management of various scenarios we may face. I know the committee will understand what I mean in saying our public messaging is extremely important. We are committed to being as open and transparent as possible, not least because we recognise that ill-informed or ill-judged comments could make the managing of the challenges prison officers face all the more difficult. There is no doubt that we face unprecedented challenges, not least because just over 32 per cent of those we have responsibility for have mental health issues, and 50 per cent suffer from addictions, while 55 per cent have a history of self-harm. We also have a significant number of prisoners who meet the threshold as described by the Public Health Agency in terms of age and underlying medical conditions. I want to assure the committee today that supporting our staff and keeping those in our care safe is our primary focus. I know that prison officers and prison staff will do everything they can to support myself and senior governors as we seek to navigate our way through the turbulent days ahead. We may not always get it absolutely right, but the committee can be assured that we will do the very best we can. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and then we'll take the two gentlemen shortly. Um, there are some questions, Deborah, that's probably applicable right across the justice system, just that I wanted to pick up on. Um, the internal management of this, um, you said the first meeting was on the 10th of March. 
That was the that was the meeting which was held across the justice system, so it included <laughs> the department, its agencies, and its NDPBs, as well as the PPS, PSNI, and probation board. So it was the first time that we actually came together collectively. But there was a, a onward um, ongoing engagement with each of those between the business business between the bus, different business areas. But what we wanted to do was bring everyone together, so we were hearing the one message and what each of us were facing. And how often is that meeting? So we're now meeting daily. We have a conference call daily. We're not okay. physically meeting, of course, um, but we are um, having daily conference calls. And we also have a setup over the weekend so that we can message each other if there's anything that happens that we all need to be aware of. And the point then that you've made that decisions taken within the department um, aren't taken in isolation, that they reflect the knock-on impact. How are you ensuring that that those decisions are being taken in the collective rather than in isolation. So again, that is the purpose of, of the conference call, to make sure that we're aware of what are the challenges each of us are facing and what we're proposing to do to manage those, to ensure that we then know how will it affect the place or how it affect the prisons, etc. Um, and again, we're making sure that our messaging around this is trying to be as consistent as possible, whilst at the, at the, at the same time making sure that we're maintaining as normal a service as we possibly can. And how then does the department uh, link in with all of the other departments so that the decision taken within the Department of Justice's responsibility isn't having a knock-on effect on health or another part of the, the government? So um, we now have um, the operations centre that's in place, so there is the um, daily reporting that goes back into TEO and that coordinates that to understand what the um, issues are across the NICS and make sure that everyone understands again how we're impacting on each other. Um, and what was the impact that has been felt with schools that have already closed in terms of the pressures on staff that are involved in prisons and police and across the justice system? Okay, so you'll appreciate that you know today's like the first day that we're really feeling the impact of this, given the announcement yesterday. Um, at the moment, um, there are arrangements in place for people to have special leave, and we already had been looking at how we resource people with laptops, etc., to be able to facilitate working from home. Not all our business, obviously, can accommodate that, but we are looking at this. We are also looking at a number of other measures where we might get into working rotas, reduced hours to accommodate those who have child caring um, responsibilities, etc. We are very much in the early stages of this, um, but of course we're having immediate impacts with people having to stay at home to look after their children. But we have ongoing contact with those staff and make sure that we're keeping in contact and managing the situation. And is it the policy in the department that people that are having to take parental leave are being put on unpaid parental leave to do this? So the policy at the moment states um, that we can accommodate with five days special leave in order to allow people to look at what alternative arrangements that they can make. Um, the guidance also says that, that that special leave can be looked at and extended in the event of it being related to the coronavirus. We're obviously working our way through that at the moment and we want to make sure that we can accommodate people who need to look after their children. And will that be a Department of Justice? special leave approach or will it be applied right across the civil service and secondly uh, will unpaid parental leave be refused to those that request it uh, given the need for key frontline workers to remain in post so this is an nics policy that we are applying so justice will not work in isolation it will follow the nics policy um, and as to people being refused unpaid leave um, there would have to be a very clear reason why we would not be able to accommodate unpaid leave where people have very significant caring responsibilities. But again, this will be up to individual line managers to consider this on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, what's the case that's being made from the department that uh, police officers, prison officers and who else would be regarded as key workers as the executive formulates the criteria for people's children that should continue to receive education in schools? The criteria for key, the key workers. <laughs> so you, you didn't, Ronnie rightly said, and I agree with him, prison officers are key workers and we need to be identifying key workers' families that need to have their children continue to receive education and childcare in order for them to actually be on the street as police officers and in the prisons. 
So again, it's back to what we have deemed to be business critical areas. So we are currently assessing all of those areas and of course prison officers and police officers are included within that. And we know that the Department of Education just commissioned an exercise um, very quickly in the last couple of hours, which we are responding to. But we are obviously collating that data at the moment. Ronnie, in terms of um, the, the prison service, um, <clears throat> what's the trigger point for uh, taking decisions around visitation, for example? Uh, well, Chair, we're reviewing that on a, on a daily basis. Um, uh, both the Minister and I are firmly of the view that we should keep visits operating for as long as we possibly can. Um, that contact between prisoners and families is, is crucially important. Uh, but we know that the day is coming uh, when we will have to take uh, difficult decisions there. So we're looking at the minute on a daily basis in terms of what our staffing levels are. Uh, we're in contact, obviously, with the Public Health Agency in terms of the best health advice. Um, and I couldn't give you a definitive trigger point at this stage. Uh, but what I can say to the committee is we are, we are looking at it, along with governors, on a, on a daily basis. Uh, have you had the case made to you from prison officers and indeed there are other support staff within prison establishments, not just officers, that they won't be able to continue in their role if they have to look after their children as a result of school closures? We, we are very aware uh, of the issues that are facing prison staff, both in terms of self-isolation and also in terms of the current responsibilities uh, that, they, that they have or some of them will have. Um, and we will we will work with individuals um, as best we can to ensure that we that we meet their we meet their needs. Um, up to this point, um, we have been able to manage that issue uh, very skillfully. I think on the part of governors. Uh, obviously, when schools close next week, that will be an added uh, and a very significant challenge to us. And. Again, I asked this of Deborah, but I know um, I've had prison officers and others right across the public sector contact me about the issue around being put on unpaid parental leave, and I've already been told by some that there is policies in place that that's being refused because it is critical that they're there on duty. So uh, what approach is the prison service taking when it comes to officers who are saying, I have to take leave? Well, I'm, I'm not aware, Chair, of, of anyone that's been refused um, leave in those circumstances uh, up, to, up to this point. Um, as Deborah indicated, uh, the NICS policy will be in place, and we will, we will follow that because we are civil servants, uh, just like everyone else in, in the Department of Justice. But you know, we very much understand the pressures uh, that, that our staff are facing. We, we want to support them through this. Um, flexibility will be will be important um, because you know at the end of the day you know we we can't close we have to continue on and manage and uh, support and look after the people that are that are currently in our on, in our care but we are not under any illusions how difficult that will uh, or that how difficult that could become um, in the days ahead. Okay, Patsy McLeod. Yeah, thanks very much, Chair, and um, thank you both for for being here today. Just um, a number of issues, in no particular. Just following through on, on the prisons issue, um, has anyone looked? I'm sure there are a range of options. Um, one is that of potential early release, and now, but then, given and I'm listening to to the figures there, you talk about 50% of people with addictions, 55% at risk of self harm. That could probably further compound the problem and compound a social problem on the streets for people and for those who might risk uh, falling homeless and all those sort of things. So, uh, which brings me back to the issue of visitations. Um, there, there is no way of getting away from that one, that where doctor surgeries, schools, all of those are, uh, well, running the risk or removing people from uh, social at the point of social distancing and all those sort of things. All it would take is, is one visitor. And I'm not saying that staff or anybody else or couldn't bring it in. That could then really leave prisons in virtual lockdown. Um, so what what provision have you made for situations like that? And 
it moves you to an even more difficult situation if, if you have, um, God forbid that you would have, major outbreak in a prison and everybody is then put into self-isolation already in a degree of self-isolation as it is but they do have, people do have uh, arrangements made to socialise with others and to mix and get out for walks and uh, training and, and those types of things so uh, I take it you have given considerations to the options that might be available in, in worst case scenarios. Well, the first thing we did several weeks ago uh, was to identify areas within each of our prison establishments that would become, in effect, isolation units. Um, and we would put individuals in there if we had concerns about them, or indeed if we had a, if we had a confirmed case. Um, now, we currently have one person uh, in, in McGilligan who is in, in an isolation unit, and I think it's four uh, in McGabry. So, um, if we take the McGilligan case, for example, um, if our healthcare partners um, advise us that the trigger points in terms of the person having a, a cough, sustained cough, or their temperature um, above the threshold uh, that's, been, that's been set, then we will immediately move that person into an isolation area as a precaution. So uh, last weekend at McGabry, we had a number of individuals who came into our care. We were concerned about them, uh, so we put them immediately uh, into isolation. We didn't bring them through our normal reception procedures. We brought them in. We put them into the isolation unit until such, such times as our colleagues in, uh, in health were able to swab them and bring those results back. Thankfully, the results were negative, and those individuals then moved out into the general population. So it's a very fluid situation, as you'll appreciate, uh, but we do have those units available. Now, I think the second point uh, you were raising with me is, is around the volume. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, the more cases we have, the more difficult that becomes in the context of the prison population. Uh, so we do have plans in place in terms of isolating those individuals. It may be that we isolate them in their cells. Hopefully we can still move them to dedicated dedicated areas. Uh, but the numbers in terms of the people involved will be the challenge for us. Um, I mean, you're, you're right about, about visitors. Um, and we, we have wanted, and we've been taking our lead from, from health and, and what's happening uh, elsewhere, we have wanted to try and keep visits open for as long as possible. Um, and we have been advising visitors uh, in terms of you know, not presenting if you have a cough or you have a temperature or you feel you have any, any symptoms. Um, and we've been managing that right through, right through the week. Um, as I said earlier, how long we can continue to sustain that position um, is questionable. Uh, we will have a facility, though, um, in extreme cases, where, where people uh, need to see family members. For, exactly, for example, if there's a bereavement in yes. the family, we could facilitate a closed visit in, in those very strict circumstances, but, but that will be exceptional. That, that, won't be the, that won't be the rule as we move on. OK, and if I could, Chair, just <clears throat> moving on to the bereavement issue, and this is one for, for the Department. Coroners. Um, the issue of coroners, and it, it will become an inevitability. Um, do you feel that you have sufficient resource there? And, and what are they? Everybody's doing modelling now. I presume you've done some sort of form of modelling in regard to uh, the number of coroners that you have, and potentially the number of coroners that you might need. And are, are you looking at situations where people who have retired and just like medics and stuff have been? potentially been brought back into service again. Yes, absolutely. Um, we are looking at a number of ways in which to manage that and make sure that we can manage the volume that could crystallise. So it's not actually my particular side of the house, but yes, oh, yeah. I know that there are those plans are in place. So yeah. I can give you some more detail if you'd like. If we could, yeah, please. Sure. I think it, unfortunately, it's yeah, the reality that's going to be there, I would think. So, Chair, thank you. Um, thank you. Um, okay. Paul Frey. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, can I ask about the budget, Deborah? So we have all this money, which is barn of consequential, start with. But I have yet to see anything that tells me that the executive are prioritising money <coughs> to spearhead some sort of 
defence or campaign against it. Uh, when will that modelling or action take place whereby we look at everything we do, and this isn't just applying to justice, of course, this is applying right across the agenda. But at the minute, what we've talked about is the 100 million with regards to the rates holiday, the 660 million, I think, coming down from the decisions that the Chancellor has made, which then is going into the grants for the business and stuff. But there's been no debate yet or talk about executive rechanneling money back into the centre in order to use it where we need to use it in the coming weeks and months. Is do, are those discussions taking place? Yeah, so we, we are collecting information at the moment about what the consequences of the coronavirus are going to be and where we think we're going to need money to be redirected into those areas. And I'm sure you'll appreciate within the department as well, we will obviously prioritise what we're doing to make sure that we're focusing on this crisis that we're facing. It strikes me that in the justice world, you probably need all and more. So you would probably be a net beneficiary as a department probably going forward in any sort of scenario of, of defence. Uh, so but you still have a job of work to do within the department to say, well, the things that aren't important at this present time, they're usually important, but at this point in time, they're not priority. Absolutely. And you may well have to strip that money in those places. For instance, I see Peter behind you, but so if, if courts aren't functioning properly, then you would think uh, if probation board aren't doing a role or have pegged back their role, so there'll be movement there with regards to finance. But ultimately, this should be an executive. Yeah. So there, there is information being um, collated across departments and being collated by the Department of Finance. Um, and within our own department, we are looking at what we are prioritising and the things that we have already pulled back on in order to deal with what we're currently being presented with and other areas that we will pull back on further. And whether that will free up actual budget or whether it frees up people in order to be focused on the frontline delivery, not just in our own department, but potentially re-diverted into other departments as well. Explain to me a wee bit about the meetings. Uh, so... Usually in a crisis, a lot of people meet, and they have a lot of meetings. Uh, decisions are usually what needs to happen, so it's the doing that actually makes a difference. How, if you're sitting around a table with experts, and you come to a conclusion today, something needs looked at seriously. It could be anything. It could be the smallest wee thing that could escalate into the massive thing next week. I'll uh, give you an example, gas metering for elderly folk. They can only top up so much in their gas at home. If all the shops are shut next week, they won't be able to obtain money for or gas. So that's one example, right? I'm using that as an illustration. There's bound to be multitudes, plethoras of those examples and those scenarios that we all need to game. But when you used to say to run a table or around a conference call that this is critical, this needs looked at now. I have always a big problem with the cogs turning very slowly in this place. Um, it's just a sign of government, I suppose, everywhere. How do those cogs get quickened up, and how does that potential problem that you think is a problem, how does that get up to decision making <coughs> executive? So, um, obviously, we have our forum, which makes sure that we know immediately that there is an issue, and we all have contact numbers and a group where we can immediately go on and tell people that there isn't a specific issue that we all need to deal with. But then there is relaxing of some of the, of the rules around some of these things, so business cases for anything that are to do with the coronavirus are being waived. So you can see that we are able to take decisions quickly. It does mean that we will be setting aside usual rules. They, we will document what we do and why we did it, but we need to be able to respond quickly and swiftly, and everyone recognises that at this stage. So. I can't give you any specifics, but you know we do have the mechanisms in place, and we are trying to make sure within that form that we have that there is a consistency of approach. And as we know, the guidance is changing, the situation is changing, and the way in which we manage that is going to change, and we need to make sure that we are all aware of how we need to... So who's in that forum? So in that forum um, is um, departmental representatives, um, the um, representatives from all of our agencies, um, PBNI... PSNI and um, PPS. So then how do you link into the other departments and the executive? 
So that is done then through um, our, our emergency planning. So um, there is the uh, Departmental Operations Centre, um, and that makes sure that we collect all of the information of what the situation is across the department. That gets fed up into TO, that gets collated then across the NICS, and we have an NIC view of where, where we are. So, and that's a daily reporting mechanism, and that might ramp up. So, how, how then can you be assured that whenever you have hit something that you think could be really critical important, so whether it's Deborah or Ronnie or Peter or Alan, hold on a minute, there's something here we need to fix now. Mm -hmm. How confident are you that once you get that into your head, you visualise the problem? How quickly does that get from your brain to the executive and, 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 and reinforced so that they know the potential the damage could be done, the importance and significance of the thought that yeah. you've just had. So obviously we have say we have our forum, we have our contacts in a minute, but we know that there's something that's a huge emergency, we go to that, then we will obviously Peter will then obviously speak to our minister and she will obviously then inform the executive of whatever the situation is and that should obviously be the way that, that would work quickly and hopefully very swiftly. So you have an executive who's getting bombarded with all the departments and all these pressures, all these risks, all these problems, how do they triage that? I know it's above you, I know it's above you but how can yeah. you be confident? How can I be confident? Well, let me take that away and find out how I make sure that I'm confident. But I would have what the, the, the process I just outlined, I would like to think would work. But again, I will go back and just double check for you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Two quick points, Deborah, and then I'll bring in Rachel. Um, testing of staff so that we're not having to self-isolate for seven days or even 14 days if that's not necessary. Immediately, someone displays symptoms. They're tested, and if that's clear, they can get back to work. What's the department doing to get testing provided to the police, the prison? We don't have any role in testing. Well, well, has the department been told from the Department of Health we're going to provide testing kits to the prison service, to the police officers? No? Uh, no. I mean, I've had discussions with um, our partners in South Eastern Trust around, around testing. There are very clear procedures in place in terms of testing prisoners, um, and those have been tried and, and are working well. In terms of testing staff, um, we discussed that with the South Eastern Trust. Now, we're, we're not at this point, uh, as I understand it, testing um, nurses or doctors coming into to hospitals. Uh, that that may, have, may have changed, but the latest information I have is that we're not. So the South Eastern Trust uh, are not uh, suggesting that they would test their staff coming into prisons, um, and therefore, at this point in time, we're not uh, we're not testing testing our staff coming into prisons. Well, I know but, health workers, but, but we will tested. Sorry, I know health workers want tested. Well, I know, I know clear. I and, suspect that's the same for prison and, officers, and, police and officers. And I, and I think, chair, the the issue for us all is that things are changing almost on an hourly mm -hmm. basis um, rather than a daily basis, but w I can only give you the current position. Well, I suppose um, my, my, my issue here is because I appreciate that the testing, who that's being led by, you're going to be given the kits, you're not yes. responsible for ordering them. What I want to know is that's being raised within the Department of Justice, your daily meeting, this is something that your staff are saying, because they're saying it to me, that's being fed through to if it's Deborah's the lead, and Deborah's then relaying that into TEO to say, here's a need that's being presented. So I'm seeking that reassurance that when it comes to testing of key frontline workers, that rather than people having to isolate for 14 days if they don't have it, but they're for the for the abundance of caution, that's the approach people are taking. But if you don't have it and you can be turned around in 24 hours, you can get back into the prison and on, in the, onto the street for the police rather than waiting for 14 days. I just want to be reassured, is that a priority within the department? If it's not, okay, that's a matter for the department. And if it is, the case is being made that this is something that is needed. Not sure who's best. Well, it, well it's certainly been an issue that, that we have been talking to health partners about. I mean, I haven't raised it with the department at this stage because we've been dealing with that. Uh, we've been dealing with that ourselves. but. I mean, Deborah and I will, will look at this matter separately. I assume that relates to the PPE, the, the, the equipment, you know, the, the personal protection equipment as well, and, and circumstances. You're going to need staff. If a prisoner gets this, then they're going to need to have the, the protective equipment to be able to assure themselves. Absolutely, and there is protective equipment in each of our prisons. Um, 
and an operating procedure has been issued to governors in terms of how that should be used and when that should be used. Okay, thank you. Rachel? Thank you, um, and thank you for coming today. I really appreciate it. It's certainly very important that we are kept up to date because, unfortunately, many of us are getting our news from Twitter um, about what our executive is up to. Um, one of my questions has been answered in terms of testing, um, and just to confirm that prisoners are being tested. They're, they're being tested if there is a suspicion that they have the virus, yes. They're not routinely not being routinely, tested. Not routinely, but they are. Okay. Yeah. And in terms of the ones that had been tested, the one in McGilligan and Fort McGabry, were those new prisoners coming in? Um, the the four, um, there were there were six prisoners, sorry, five prisoners came in over the weekend um, that we had concerns about. They were isolated and tested and are now in the general population. Uh, the individual who's currently in... McGilligan was a serving prisoner um, who took on well, and the results for that are due back fairly fairly soon. Um, and the four that are currently in McGabry, I think, were new committals yesterday. Okay, thank you. Um, in terms of the visitation, um, obviously, I completely understand why that, um, for many reasons, has to continue. But would social distancing be practised during visitation? It's very difficult to practice social distancing in, in a visits area. Um, I mean, typically in a visits area, the tables are quite are quite close together, um, so it, it would be difficult for us to it'd be difficult for us to do that. Um, you know, indeed, you know, at McGabry, for example, we also transport prison, uh, visitors down to the prison, so it, it's not it's not an answer of itself in, in our case. Okay, no, I, I understand. Um, in terms of the wider sort of civil service, it's just picking up on a point there with regards to staff pay, especially for people affected up to five days. What happens after five days? So the guidance says that you can then take unpaid leave, um, annual leave or flexi leave. Um, and it always does, my reading of it, it does provide a little bit of flexibility um, if your absence is coronavirus related and there may be an opportunity to extend that special leave, but that is yet to be confirmed. We're trying to, obviously the guidance just came out yesterday evening and we're just working our way through the practical implications of that. Okay, um, I just don't, there's, I'm sure like everybody here, we've been inundated in the last couple of weeks, especially from people who have either lost their jobs, about to lose their jobs, or are worried about losing their jobs. Um, and it's very unclear about what is in place for those who don't have any contractual sort of, um, there's nothing in their contracts to, to ensure that they're going to be able to pay their rent, because again, we don't have any information about what's happening if you rent. Um, would there be a case that the civil service policy would be looking at potential redundancies? I have not been given any indication of that. Um, and the, finally, just on prioritising the highest priority issues will obviously increase and lower priority cases. What defines a lower priority? Well, business, you were talking about business yeah. that we are, yeah, so business that um, are, is not critical to frontline delivery. So, you know, Things, well, I can give you a few examples. We have re-diverted people out of our organisational development area, which is where we look after our people plan, which is all about our care for people. And those people have re been re-diverted um, into activities around the coronavirus, the coordination, the business continuity planning and elements of that. Um, I think you were due to see our business plan in a couple of weeks. And again, that has had to be, you know, just paused because again, we are taking people off that activity to make sure that we're focusing on this. So we're doing on that sort of incremental base, some of those areas that we know that, well, we can, we can stop some of this activity for a limited period of time and it shouldn't have too big an impact, um, but we're working our way through it at the moment. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Gemma. Thank you very much and thank you both very much for coming in. Um, can I just say as well um, that I welcome the Lord Chief Justice statement um, on the approaches taken to protect court and jury proceedings. Um, and I have two questions, and this is my first Justice Committee meeting, so if, it's, if I'm asking the wrong questions, just let me know. Um, the first one's for Deborah. Um, can legal aid continue in this? And um, have there been any um, steps to work with staff yes. on it? So we, we have been looking again within um, the Legal Services Agency on how we can manage the situation and how we can make sure that payments continue to be made. Um, and we know that we can obviously make hardship payments, so those things should help 
and we don't know how bad the situation will get and we'll have to continue to monitor that and to take appropriate action but yes Paul Andrews the chief executive um, does have plans in place and has been liaising um, with the Law Society and the Bar on some of the issues that have, have occurred. Um, and Ronnie, the, um, it's been brought to my attention, um, solicitors mobile phone numbers aren't allowed to be saved on the prisoners phones to call out, um, but given that solicitors won't be in their offices and um, video links won't be operating from courts, I know some solicitors have asked NIPS to place their numbers on phones. Are you aware of this, or can you give me an update? I'm, I'm not aware of any particular solicitor asking asking okay. that. That's not to say that it hasn't happened yeah. uh, at an establishment level, but I'll certainly look into that and, and come back to you. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you. Okay. Um, that's the rest of my questions have been answered. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Doug? Uh, thanks, uh, Chair. Deborah, could you... Uh, this may not be your field, and you did say it wasn't your field, but, but uh, it's an important field. Yeah. Our death management system and how we're going to deal with, with deaths in, in Northern Ireland. I'm, I'm looking at the proposals which are sitting in Westminster, which culturally don't match what we do here in Northern Ireland, um, in, in, the, in the manner in which, in the manner in which we deal with deaths, um, and the speed in which we deal with deaths, uh, and the cremation problems that we deal with deaths, bearing in mind we, I think we bury about 16,000 a year, and our capacity probably for Northern Ireland is about 30 to 35,000 a year. Well, where are we with this de death management system at the minute? What are, we, what are we doing in regards to this? What's, what advice are we handing out at the minute? Certainly to, to, to the likes of undertakers. So again, it isn't my area, and I would really prefer if I could maybe take that away and, and provide you an answer to that, if that would be... Oh, no, ab 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 absolutely. Um, okay, I mean, I mean I, I just, and I'm not asking for another answer, but Deborah, you've given the answer, that's fine. But I believe there might be advice coming out today. Could I just ask, so do, do you know if, if we are feeding into this bill? Just are yes. very, we are? Oh, yes, we have, we have fed into this bill, yeah. Okay, well, we'll have enough of that. Sort of moving on to, to um, the, the prisons, and, and Ronnie, I don't think this is for you, by the way, but I, I just say that I think your staff are doing a fantastic job, a genuinely fantastic job Keep. in a very difficult situation. And in many ways, other people will think that a prison is an isolation unit, as it is, but it's not. It's a very live, um, you know, there is so much incredible movement. Um, but I would ask this very direct question. If the serving prisoner comes back as positive, mm. then the transmission to him is likely to have been through contact with family. Um, it, 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 would we then go through that tracing system? But would that, would that flavour whether or not you would stop visitations or not? Um. Well, as I said earlier, we're looking at visitations on a daily basis, taking health advice, looking at our staffing levels and, and so on. So there are a range of factors that will influence the decision as to when we need to either reduce or stop uh, visiting within within uh, prison establishments. If we had someone within one of our prisons, we absolutely would want to understand, as you've said, uh, how that how that got in, um, and that may be uh, a determining factor in terms of our overall decision um, around around visiting. But thankfully, to this point, we're 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 not at that stage, um, and hopefully, uh, through the, the the work we're doing, that we can we can prevent that certainly for as long as we can. And certainly with your staff, Ronnie, and I understand the testing issue, and, and you're you're going with where everybody else is. I, I I get that, but do you have a hard deck in regards to your staff? I'd, I'd, do, do, do you have a, a, a point where you say, my staff is so low that I'm now going to have to introduce the next stage, and that next stage could be lockdowns, or that next stage could be prisoners' release? Um, and the follow-on to that, then, are we in consultation with the probations board? So if we do have to do prisoner release, have we got increased capacity in the probations board to deal with any of those who have to be released in, for a shorter period of time? Um. In, in terms of answering your question, I'm, I'm meeting uh, on a daily basis with senior governors. Um, and in those meetings, which happen early in the mornings, I'm looking to them and, and asking the questions around staffing, around regime, around visits, and what key decisions do they need uh, me and the headquarters team to take uh, in that day. Um, and that gives me an opportunity then to make that assessment and we're appropriate to consult with the minister if, if that if that's if that's required. So we're we're doing that on a on a on a daily basis. Um, we we obviously do have models in place uh, around 
um, the staffing levels, we need to do certain things, um, and we will take the decisions we need to take based on uh, based on that information. But but it is on a daily basis now, which is why when the chair asked me earlier about a trigger point, I said, well, I can't actually give you that at this point, but the assurance is we're looking at it day by day. So uh, could I just ask, then, then Ronnie, just on, on, a, on a follow up to that, and you may not be able to answer this, but if we do have to go into limited short term prisoner release, who makes the decision on who gets released? Where's that decision made? Is, it, is there a board that does that? Um, who, 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 who's the ultimate say? It doesn't sit with you. Really. Well, we, we have. Um, we have authority under uh, rule. Uh, sorry, I'm just getting. I want to give the, the committee the right, um, the right rule under Rule 27 provides for a prisoner to be temporarily released for any periods and subject to any conditions. So that that provision is there. So the committee will be aware when the bill that you referred to earlier was, was first talked about. Uh, government were looking at taking a specific provision in that. That's no longer the case because government believe that the prison services have uh, sufficient cover under Rule 27 uh, to take that decision. Um, second uh, area that we could look at is under Article 19 of the Criminal Justice Order, uh, which would allow us to uh, release certain prisoners on licence. And that comes back to the point you referred to earlier around the probation service. Uh, now, we have to look very carefully because there's no point in moving a problem from one area to another area, um, and therefore, obviously, I am in contact with the with the probation service because, you know, there's no point in me taking a decision to release um, or, or to ease pressure on the prison service if that, in turn, then is going to create an even bigger problem for probation. So, we would be looking um, primarily at Rule 27 in terms of temporary release. Now, I have to stress we're not at that stage or anywhere yeah. near that stage um, be before people who might be listening to this start to, to, get, to get excited, but um, it, is, it is available to us um, should we need to, to make, that, uh, make that call. And obviously I would want to do that in consultation uh, with the Minister. And of course, and, 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 and I'll stress as well, Ronnie, we are purely talking contingencies. We, we are, absolutely. So it's not absolutely not scaremongering anybody yeah. here whatsoever. But, but, but Deborah, just on that, with that contingency planning, then uh, are, are we are we saying that the probation board is looking how it can increase capacity? Because if there were to be on a contingency footing, um, people having to be released, then then their then their 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 role may may increase twofold, or, or, the, or the number of people they're looking after may increase twofold. Well, maybe it might be better if I oh, put okay. that in, in, in fairness to Deborah. I mean, that would only be the case if we we're releasing people under Article 19 of the Criminal Justice Order. Right. And I think what I'm saying to you at the minute is I'm, I'm not You're looking not at that, because I think uh, you know, that would be, I think, unfair and unwise to, to, take that, uh, to take that decision, certainly at this stage. We can't rule anything out in the future, uh, but certainly at this stage, that's not what we're, that's not what we're looking at. Well, do me a favour, for my knowledge only, please. Um, the difference between Rule 19 and, and was it 27, did you say? Well, Article, Article 19 yeah, um, right. enables the prison service to release certain prisoners on licence, which and that would bring and that's in looked after by the pre and that would bring in the probation service. Whereas uh, Rule 27 allows for the temporary release um, of individuals for periods uh, and under conditions that we might that we might impose as a, as a service. And that wouldn't, they wouldn't then fall under the probation? They, they wouldn't necessarily fall under the probation. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Gordon. Thanks, Chair, and thanks very much, Lucy, for your presentation. In relation to protective clothing, we've heard a lot about it in the media over recent days. Have both your staff and, and the health-related uh, staff, have they adequate uh, protective, personal protective equipment, and have they received the appropriate training for it, for using it? Um, we certainly in the prison service have protective clothing uh, in each of our establishments and it has been used to date in each of our establishments. Um, there is, as I said earlier, standing orders around how that is to be used um, and governors are aware of that and those orders are being, are being implemented. In terms of the amount um, that we have, yeah. uh, 
I suppose that depends on, on, on how much we how much we need, but I think we, like every other organisation, uh, would certainly want to have more than we than we currently we currently have. Yeah, so you, it's on order, I suppose, like a, a lot of organisations. We're, we're in the same position uh, yeah, as the yeah. BSNI and, and yeah. healthcare staff. Where, where, where do you staff. see uh, prisoners that may unfortunately be tested positive? Where would they be treated? Uh, well, well, that will depend, and that will be a judgment call for our healthcare partners. Um, it may be that, depending on the seriousness of their condition, they would have to be taken to an outside hospital, um, or they may be treated within the prison in one of our isolation units. It, it will be a case-by-case -case basis, but, but that will not be a, a judgment call or a decision for me. I, I will rely on the healthcare staff to, uh, to the advise us on what is the appropriate course of action. There are appropriate wards available, obviously, where, where you would have a, a security aspect to deal with. Well, people go out from prisons all the time to outside hospitals, um, and we as a service are very often required to put what we call a bed watch on uh, to, sub to, uh, to monitor and, and look after those individuals. But, you know, again, it will be a case-by-case -case basis in terms of what we're, what we're dealing with at any given time. OK, thank you. A couple of other points, just on um, the civil service issue. Um, if a member of staff um, under test shows positive, will those people go on to uh, certified sick pay? So um, there's a there's a series of, of steps in this. Um, so we can give the, the special leave if some if someone requires it. Um, we can someone can self isolate. For, for seven days, um, and if they are deemed to have tested positive, they are then um, recorded as sick. But the sick is recorded as being coronavirus related, and therefore is treated differently from other sick. It's tra treated differently. So it means it doesn't accumulate. You know, you don't know how many days you've been off sick, except so around your trigger points. Treated separately. Like Pardon? It's treated separately. It's recorded yes. separately. Yes, it's recorded as a separate and will be treated separately from other illnesses. Well, okay, that's right. Thank you. Um, sorry, Rachel just wants to pick up on that point. Yeah, just in terms of the test, uh, sorry, so someone, if someone has symptoms and is told to self isolate for seven days, and if they're tested positive, uh -huh. that would require them getting a test? Yeah, they don't have to. I mean, the, the issue here is that we can't rely on the testing anymore yeah. because we don't know if people will get tested. So we're not second guessing any of that. Okay. You know, so I, mean, I, I can give you the the guidance on this, but um, if they have self-isolated um, then and they are displaying the symptoms, then it gets recorded. We don't need a doctor's certificate to that to that effect, except to that as a way that it is recorded. Sorry, you don't need a doctor's certificate? No. Yeah, would sure. definitely appreciate a wee bit more detail if you can. Yeah, no, I, I can that, definitely, I can give you a wee bit more information that, on that. Sure. That would be fantastic. So yeah, self-certification, and sorry, Chair. Yeah, no. It's self-certification yes. without a test. Yes, yeah. okay. certification and is yeah. extended beyond the normal seven days. Yeah, just on the, the barrier arrangement, which is highly sensitive, as you can appreciate, are there um, plans to, to speed up the process of, of, for the use of better terms? So again, I think that's something I would prefer to take away and come back to you on. Yeah, yeah. I think it's something that is highly sensitive and, and could be, and I think what needs to be dealt with a very cautious approach. Thanks, Chair. OK, can I rotate now the witnesses and then... We'll sorry, oh, sorry Patsy. One, one wee item, please. So they will be coming back. Aye, it's just to, to come back to uh, Ronnie here. Um, how long does it take to train up a prison officer? Um, it's a nine-week training course at the Prison Service College. All oh, right, right. And then there's ongoing training thereafter in terms of gaining their certificate of competence, which we link in with the Ulster University. So oh, um, I'm just kind of thinking ahead here. You know the way the, the nurses, there have been special arrangements for nurses there and, and the likes. Um, I, I presume you have considered this option if a requirement is needed for bring people yes. in to supplement and learn basically on the job, then you have considered that, that option. Absolutely. We're, we're considering... We're considering all options. It is it is more challenging in a prison environment because of the training, yes. uh, because of the training aspect, as you quite rightly said. So we're we're looking at you know can we redeploy 
some staff that would free up additional operational resources that would go uh, closer to the front line, if I can put it that way. Uh, there was a new recruitment process recently, wasn't there? Yes, we 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 are in the. Uh, we have a number of ongoing recruitment processes. I mean, we have a, a class at the Prison Service College that are due to pass uh, out of the college next Friday, um, and they will then start their their all but one going to Magabry on the Monday on the Monday morning. Uh, we have another class coming in next week uh, to start their training. And what sort of numbers are we talking about there? Um, the class I think that's passing out next week is 17 right. members in it, um, and there will be a similar number right. due to start next next Monday. That's grand. Okay, thank, okay. thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, folks. We're all set. Um, so we're, we're going to hear now from Peter Lunny, Chief Executive of the Northern Ireland Courts and Tribunal Service, and Alan Todd, Assistant Chief Constable for District Policing and the coronavirus planning within the organisation. So, um, gentlemen, you're very, both very welcome. Again, I'll hand over um, Peter if you want to go first, um, you, and then Alan, and then we'll have some questions. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the Northern Ireland Courts and Tribunal Services developed a, a graduated response to the current public health emergency, which, depending on the prevailing circumstances and available resources, entails working with the judiciary and partners uh, and other stakeholders to slow down lower priority business. We've been working closely with the Office of the Lord Chief Justice on practical arrangements uh, to reduce the need for attendance at court, including the adjournment of cases administratively, dispensing with the requirement for parties to attend save in certain specified circumstances, and making greater use of technology to facilitate remote and virtual hearings in place of traditional face-to-face -face hearings. On the 17th of March, the Lord Chief Justice issued directions on the handling of court business, which sought to limit the scope uh, uh, of any risks to health while maintaining the administration of justice. He has directed that starting yesterday, judges should not require the attendance at court of persons who do not need to be there or who express individual concerns. This includes individuals where it may be sufficient for their legal representatives to act on their behalf. Lord Chief Justice considers that applications for adjournments may be dealt with administratively by way of correspondence in writing or email. In family cases, orders may be continued on consent without requiring the parties to attend, and if a party wishes to challenge the extension of any order, they should contact the court office setting out uh, the request and the reasons for the application. We're working to increase the amount of court business that can be dealt with by way of video link, Skype or telephone conference. Judges will continue to deal with priority proceedings, which typically involve the uh, immediate liberty, health, safety or well-being of individuals. Examples might include in criminal proceedings, first remands, bail applications and sentencing, where delay to sentencing may mean time and remand exceeds any likely or realistic custody period under the sentence. In family proceedings, it could be non-molestation orders in domestic violence cases. Children order applications such as care orders, prohibited steps orders, emergency protection orders and secure accommodation orders. Uh, and it could also include declaratory judgments in patient cases or child abduction proceedings. Civil proceedings which would be considered a priority might include habeas corpus applications, urgent injunctions or urgent judicial reviews. Given the particular challenge of managing jurors in a manner consistent with social distancing, and the risk to the integrity of proceedings should jurors develop COVID symptoms. Um, uh, we've had, uh, the, sorry, the Chief Justice has directed that no new jury trials should be commenced. An ongoing trial in Dungannon was discontinued when two jurors advised the judge uh, that they are in a vulnerable group. In relation to tribunal business, uh, we will work closely with tribunal chairs to implement comparable arrangements uh, to reduce footfall and to make best use of remote hearings. In relation to the largest of these, the Appeals Tribunal, which deals with benefit appeals, the President has directed that all or oral hearings uh, are being suspended with effect from today. This will be replaced with a blended model of paper-based determinations alongside audio and video hearings uh, to minimise disruption for appellants. The Appeals Service is actively reviewing uh, the appeals where it is known that the appellant could be disadvantaged as a result of the current position with the intention of prioritising those cases. The Courts and Tribunal Service will continue to work closely with the senior judiciary and tribunal chairs to respond to the very fluid situation. Generally, creative and flexible mechanisms will be pursued and tried in attempts to maintain a reasonable balance between protecting the health of all and maintaining legal certainty and finality. 
The situation will be carefully monitored to allow us to respond effectively to any developing pressures. We have the option to temporarily reduce the number of hearing rooms at a venue or to relocate business to other court venues based on the level of available resource uh, or support services or specific buildings being out of action at any given time. Communication will be critical throughout any period of disruption, and the Courts and Tribunal Service will continue to work with stakeholders to manage disruption to business. Okay, thank you, Peter. Just before I bring Alan in, um, I should have said to, to Ronnie and Deborah, don't feel obliged to have to wait until you come back. If you need to do business outside in the corridor, feel free to do that, and we'll get people to bring you back. We do want to ask you further questions, but in case you're sitting in the gallery feeling obliged to wait, I know that you are under pressure, so please go out and do the business you need to do, and then we'll call you back in. Okay. Hey, Chair, just before Alan starts, if I could um, pivot to um, Patsy's question about uh, coroners. Um, we, we don't at this stage anticipate that uh, the situation will have a significant impact on coroners. Um, where, where a death uh, occurs within 28 days of an individual having been seen by their, their medical practitioner, it's, it's not a reportable death. Uh, at the minute, um, the deaths that have occurred in, in GB have tended to take place in a, in a hospital setting, so therefore it, it wouldn't be reportable. Um, as that progresses, we, we understand that the, the bill that was referred to going through Westminster uh, will provide that that 28-day time limit won't apply anymore, so, so we expect that, that most deaths will be able to be signed off uh, uh, by, by doctors or GPs and won't require to be referred to coroners. Right. In the event that something happens that we do require additional coroners, the likely response to that will be the, asking the Judicial Appointments Commission to designate other judges uh, to act as coroners, and, and they will be provided with suitable training. Okay, okay Alan. Thank Chair, you. thank you, members. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Alan Todd. I'm Assistant Chief Constable in the Police Service, um, and I've been designated by the Chief Constable as the Gold Commander for the COVID-19 response on behalf of the Policing Service. Um, uh, our approach is very similar to what you've heard from other people, so I won't r repeat uh, all of those strands. Uh, but essentially, it looks, uh, in terms of policing, uh, we, we're used to basing, basing our response to a wide range of calls for service on a risk assessment model. What we've really done is, is upgrade that and refine that uh, with considerations uh, that COVID-19 uh, poses for first responders in the service. Specifically, what that looks like is I have a strategic command centre room open 24-7, uh, which screens every call for service. We've put additional screening questions into the contact management centre, so anybody calling police will be asked additional questions about their and their family's health, about symptomatic so warning signs that there may be COVID-19 at an address where we could be responding to for any, any range of police uh, service delivery issues. Um, and we do uh, we add that risk assessment at that point. But the 24/7 control room, uh, which will, de will be developed in days ahead, to be a full Jessup room. That's a joint emergency service inter uh, interoper inter interoperability protocol. Uh, hopefully, to include ambulance <coughs> service and fire service, uh, will allow us to provide 24/7 guidance to officers uh, and staff across the organisation and across all of their roles, so that where we do identify concerns, that they can be addressed proactively ahead of uh, deploying to that. That manages uh, public safety, it manages service delivery, and it manages officer and staff safety as well. Um, that has, we started that, we're in our third week of it, and are going into our third week of it. Um, there's not a high demand for it at this moment in time, but it does, has allowed us to practice and perfect that. As demand now increases, we're in a better place to meet that and be much ready for that. Uh, on, on a command basis, we've set out broad strands of our business in terms of business continuity. So that is service delivery, and, my day job, I'm the Assistant Chief Counsel for District Policing, local policing. So local policing and response to calls for service is one of those strands. Uh, investigative uh, capability in organisation is the second of those strands. That's your, your major investigations, all of, in fact, all investigations across the organisation, including some of those strands you'll hear about in terms of public protection, domestic abuse after this, Chair. Um, and then aside to that sort of specialist capability, search, public order, firearms, all of the things that we wrap around our daily business to manage all the challenges that we face as a police service on an ongoing day. Off to either side of that, then we also have logistics, contracts and supplies, because a lot of the conversations touching around this table fall into that space in some shape, size or form. And on the other side, uh, criminal justice and uh, statutory partners, some of which has been touched around there. So we are sure that we are joined up on our commercial partners on the one side in terms of logistics, supplies and contracts, but also in statutory partners on the other side as well. And then the three main strands of the business, investigations, deployments, 
and specialist capabilities. My job is to sit across the top of that uh, and to make sure that cross-cutting strands are, de are designed to reduce demand to policing on, on a daily basis and, uh, and increase our capability, uh, because that gives us the resilience uh, to provide services and confidence to the public that we know is going to be a very difficult time uh, where we are all organisations are faced with significant reductions in staffing because of the crisis. That's a quick overview, Chair. I'm happy to leave at that point and take specific questions on particular areas of interest. Thank you. Thank you. Alan, I'll, I'll stick with you then. Um, in, in terms of say, some of the similar questions to Ronnie, um, pressures on police officers in terms of being identified as a key worker, has that case been made so that those who are involved in the police service, their children can, can, can continue to be educated in schools? And what has been the impact on your resources as a result of those schools that have already closed? So um, I think one of the key risks that I didn't mention in my introduction, Chair, um, the confidence and reassurance of our workforce is probably going to be key to any of the workings we do operationally. If your people aren't confident and reassured in the workplace and getting to deliver service to the public is incredibly difficult. Um, police officers are, are used to moving towards dangerous situations when other members of the public are moving away from them, but that doesn't mean that we don't owe them all the confidence and reassurance we can provide them in doing that role. The impact of childcare arrangements, school closures, <coughs> Um, it's too early to give you a global impact of that. Um, uh, we rely on individuals telling us. Uh, we, sorry, I need to be clear on that. Our decision-making process around that will, requ will require one-to-one -one engagement with the people. And this isn't just for childcare arrangements, it's also for, for health care concerns and any, any other, other, other vulnerabilities. We're doing that because it's a quicker and agile way than trawling records and trying to centrally identify that. So I'm briefing middle managers and senior managers across the organisation three times a week on telephone conference with 150 people on the call yesterday on the protocols, the practices and the guidelines for doing that. And then that filters down. There's also daily emails to staff telling what that briefing contains. And then we join that together at individual briefings where senior, manager, senior managers are present in briefing rooms with their staff. And, and we try to join the communication piece there. The, what does this impact on you for childcare, healthcare vulnerabilities and other concerns? Conversations will start there and, and then be brought back to the table. And I'll get an emerging picture on that over the next week or 10 days. Um, in terms of some of your scenario planning around um, public safety, um, uh, and in all of these cases, uh, those that are involved in criminal enterprise will always seek opportunities. Has there been any scenario planning with the police as to how do we manage <coughs> this developing situation and, and what the risks are to increased criminal behaviour? So there are intelligence requirements from across the organisation that ask the very question through our, 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 our intelligence branch. Uh, there are already um, intelligence feeds coming to us through the National Crime Agency uh, and other partner agencies that inform our understanding of not only what's happening but the potential for what will happen in, in various commodities because it's crime is a, commo is, is a, com is a commodity space. Uh, and we, uh, through the three-strand approach, will be putting resources to where we feel we need to do that in response to those assessments. Clearly, in a public session, Chair, that's about as much as I can do. That's the general approach to it, and clearly there's more detail available through other accountability uh, measures as well. Um, just to check, uh, you had indicated that the Gold Command includes ambulance service and fire service, if I picked you up right? The Strategic Command uh, Centre that we're running, um, we've had meetings with senior ambulance staff yesterday through the Civil Contingency Group for Northern Ireland, which sat yesterday uh, uh, chaired at ministerial level. Uh, and we have a, a working assumption that from tomorrow, ambulance service will be uh, will be cross working with ambulance service. Fire have also made the offer, and that allows us, chair, quite simply. In some cases, it's not unusual. In fact, it's quite frequent on a daily basis for placing. You, all of you around the table will have operational experience of that, where an ambulance will turn up and require police assistance, or police will turn up and require ambulance assistance. There is a benefit, I would say, in, in day to day business anyway. But crisis brings opportunity sometimes. That to sit in a room, understand what's happening have all the information in front of us, have a joint conversation to decide what a response that looks like to ensure we get the right response with the right number of people to give the public <coughs> the service they need. The local policing aspect of it, um, I was uh, in part of my constituency this morning where that community group is developing a coordinated action plan and trying to link in with uh, other organisations as to how they can assist because there is a significant number of people in the community now volunteering, what can I do? I suppose my question is, um, what way will the police seek to interface with a lot of the community and voluntary sector that want to be involved but obviously need guidance as to how best to go about doing that? 
Uh, it's, it's a fair question, Chair, and I do think at times like this, people look to their community police officers as, as community leaders, uh, and that's going to be a challenge for policing to take a lead in that role, because as you heard the themes from some of these conversations, protecting frontline service delivery and having police to go to calls for service for people in the most need will, will clearly become the tighter and tighter focus pr uh, pr uh, as we go forward over time. So we are that work strand that sits off, as I explained earlier, around statutory partnerships and the criminal justice interface. That piece of work in there which asks exactly that question about what are the best avenues to ensure that we harness the community effort that's available to assist statutory partners generally, but at the same time protecting me from having to divert a lot of policing resources to make it work, because actually I need those resources to, con to maintain service delivery. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, Peter, just a, a couple for me on the court side of it. Um, I, I'm just trying to get in my own mind an understanding of what exactly do these changes do in terms of the whole court process from you know, the prosecution of cases, both criminal, civil, and then obviously the tribunals that are dealing with your DLA, PIPs and so on. If you can just try and spell that out in layman's language, what is going to be the real impact here on, on those different aspects of the courts? Realistically, I mean, you, you will have been in court buildings when they're operating, and, and, and certainly at the, at the start of the day, there is a huge amount of, of footfall in, in a building. So the, the priority was to try and reduce the number of, of people that were coming to court. Uh, as, as a result of the directions that have been issued by the Chief Justice, the overall effect is likely to be that, that less priority business will be um, routinely adjourned uh, without anybody needing to be in attendance. That will free up, it will free up space within court buildings. It, it will assist with to, to some extent with the social distancing, mm -hmm. uh, and it will also allow the judicial resources that are available and, and the practitioners to, to focus on the, the cases that absolutely need to proceed. Mm -hmm. That can be a range of cases. I mentioned some of them in, in relation to, to criminal business, but, but we need to also recognise that in, in family proceedings there are a raft of, of cases where orders do need to be made for a variety of reasons. It, it may well be in relation to the, the protection of individuals. It could be for uh, contact or access for children. There are, there are very serious issues which I think need to be dealt with uh, and, and can't just be adjourned ad infinitum. Um, I think that as well as reducing footfall then, we also want to make sure that the courts continue to deal with those cases that, that can be dealt with and therefore we're looking for different ways to facilitate that. Um, at the minute we are working on a, a range of templates with the, the Lord Chief Justice's office which will allow parties to make uh, written submissions uh, to allow cases to be progressed or, or disposed of. Um, we're also, uh, as I mentioned in my opening, looking at, at harnessing technology more. Um, to, to allow cases which will require oral submissions to be dealt with. And again, that might be telephone conferencing uh, or it may be video conferencing. To do that on a huge scale would, would present logistical challenges. So again, that needs to go hand in hand with, with thinning out the business mm -hmm. so that we can focus those resources on, on the cases that actually need them. So explain to me then, um, for, for some individuals, they're on bail pending court case or they're being held in remand pending court case. Is the time frame for those cases going to be longer as a result of these changes, or are those type of cases still going to be able to be proceed under the normal time frame? I think there will be a mixture. I, I think that it's more likely going to be the, the low-level summons cases, which are the ones which will be uh, adjourned for longer periods of time. Um, the fact that somebody is on bail or is in custody will be a significant factor uh, for the, the court to consider when uh, deciding how to progress a case. Um, we, we haven't got to the stage where it is, it is just purely critical business only. I think the, the Lord Chief Justice's direction that issued uh, earlier in the week tries to strike that balance between continuing work going through uh, whilst also having the resources to focus on, on those critical issues. Um, those directions will continue to be refined. I, I expect that more detailed uh, instructions will issue within the next couple of days, again, to give greater clarity to practitioners and court users. Okay, and finally, for me, um, on the legal aid aspect of this, obviously decisions are being taken uh, at an unprecedented pace. Um, the nature of those decisions may never have been taken before. What way is the legal aid system adjusting to that by way of those that are seeking to take urgent judicial reviews, recognising that we're facing unprecedented circumstances? Um, certainly. Uh Whenever we have been looking at the priorities for court business, 
we have been sharing those planning assumptions with the, the legal services agency uh, so that they are able to um, focus their staff on, on those areas that need to be focused on. So, so where an application for uh, an urgent JR uh, comes in, the uh, legal service agency will also be able to, to serve as the, the related application for legal aid for that. So, so it, it's, again, making sure that all the systems are joined up. And is the, the normal criteria, and I use that word normal advisedly in this situation, still being applied to those requests for urgent JRs on these type of decisions? Uh, I don't know that I'm in a position to address that. Um, again, maybe one that I, I'll need to speak to my colleagues in the LSA and come back to you. I'm, I'm unaware that they have changed, but I yeah. wouldn't feel confident about saying that for definite. Okay, um, that's fine. I'll leave that for now. Gemma. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, Alan, most of my questions are for you. Sorry. Um, what um, are the PSNI planning and closing stations to the public? Um, we haven't any immediate plans on that, Gemma. All of our decision making is based on the public health agency guidance, as it, and that that's moving at at least two or three times a week. Um, so, like our partners, each time we get new guidance, we look at that, we understand what that means for our business, and we make decisions accordingly. Um, thankfully, or otherwise, um, the majority of police stations across Northern Ireland, the actual footfall and the actual number of people coming in to, do, to transact business is very small now compared to what it used to be. We do a huge amount of our um, of our business on phones. We do an increasing amount of our business online. Um, and uh, So even if we do make those decisions that where it's not safe for the public to come in, actually it's more likely to be a safety issue for officers than it is for the public. Uh, but we continue to balance that against public health uh, guidance uh, and, uh, and act accordingly. But we will need to retain some open police because some people are on bail or you know, genuine inquiries to make. So we, we'd like not to rush to that, uh, but we'll just have to keep it under advisement with the public health guidance. Okay. And sort of following on from that, what measures are in place to protect staff and those detained when a person is taken into custody? Well, that's a very wide question, actually, because there's, there's a wide range of, of, of risk management across, right across the organisation. So, you know, uh, the, the other piece that will come in at 7 o'clock tonight in, in placing is that each district will have designated resources to attend those calls which are designated as having a potential COVID risk. Uh, that, that means that we re potentially reduce the number of officers in high risk circumstances or, or even low risk circumstances actually in, in, in terms of COVID because most of them are because with the general infection rate in the community that overall risk to officers is low but clearly it's not going to stay that way uh, and, I, and I wouldn't pretend or plan on the basis of it being otherwise. Um, so but to further manage that uh, we hope to we will be designating individual call signs per district from 7 o'clock tonight, 24-7, and they will be the first port of call should we identify a COVID risk associated with the call for service. Um, the, um, that allows a number of things. It allows us to understand who is responding to what. It allows us to put control around that, and it allows us to use the equipment that we have targeted on where it's most likely to be needed. Um, because, like partners around the table, equipment is an issue. Um, clearly, the custody environment shares many of the challenges you discussed uh, with Mr. Armour earlier. Uh, it's just a microcosm of it in, in, in policing terms, to be honest. And, and Mr. Armour, I spent quite a bit of time on the phone on just such issues over the weekend. So, uh, you know, that works at that level too. Um, but we have moved to create a, an isolation facility in one of our custody suites, uh, again, where we have suspected COVID risks associated with persons in custody. They will be put in that space that help, helps to manage the risk to staff and in custody of course it's police staff in terms of officers and staff and, uh, and detention officers but also healthcare staff who, who work in our custody suites as well uh, and that's an, uh, that's an attempt to make sure that we know that we can put people at that, who are at that increased risk in that place manage it accordingly and put the equipment in that place and that's just another way of making sure that the equipment and measures that we have are focused on the areas we're more likely to need them and that will be our approach going forward. And have there been any conversations around using the PSNA to assist with delivering essentials to older people or the vulnerable in society? Uh, I've not had any formal approach. Um, I, I think the answer to that is, in the first instance, is family and community. Um, but the, the, the question that the Chair asked earlier about how we harness that and how we plan it is in its infancy, uh, and I'm sure that will develop over time. Okay. And are PSNA vehicles, including the Land Rovers, being... Boosted um, hygienically in terms of cleaning. 
That's the other advantage um, that comes from uh, identified call signs, going to identified risk calls. It, it means that you're not exposing your entire fleet and your entire staff to a whole range of circumstances. So that allows us to concentrate the contractor cleaning effort on the vehicles where it needs to be, so we don't uh, have high attrition rates of the availability of fleet. But the challenge on all of this is that the people who service vehicles, clean vehicles, come to work in policing, all of, all of these organisations, some of them commercial, some of them non-commercial, some of them statutory partners, others, we're all facing the same issue of having fewer people at work. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the capacity of contracts you think you have in place are also under pressure. And that's why we're trying to uh, adjust our approach to make the best available use of the resource that we know is going to be under pressure over time. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Rachel? Thank you. Um, thank you very much for your um, updates. And again, sorry, most, uh, most of my questions are for Alan. Um, but Peter, just in terms of the um, new no new jury trials to be commenced, do you have any idea, and I appreciate that you'll probably not be able to answer this, but when, until when? Is it until further notice? Uh, it, it is indefinite. It's until further notice. I think the, the, the it will have to take account of the, the prevailing situation. I mean, that we, we paused it because of the, the challenge around social distancing and managing jurors. Until that changes, I, I don't think we will be in a position to, to restart those. Okay. Um, all right. Um, um, in terms of prioritisation of calls, yes. what would you, if you can, tell me, what is a low priority call? That hasn't changed uh, as we currently look at it. Uh, we've not made any changes to calls that we will or won't attend. Uh, what we've changed is how we judge what an appropriate response to that call looks like. So uh, we're trying to keep that as uh, as business as usual. Um, we use a, 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 a we use a, a risk assessment network, our framework called Thrive. It's a national model across UK policing, and it takes threat, harm, risk, vulnerability, and engagement, um, and it, it, it maps that against it and grades a call accordingly. Um, that will continue to be the case. All we've really done is add some COVID questions on the back of that to understand if there's a COVID risk associated with that call as well. That doesn't stop us attending it. It just it just helps us define how we do it. Um, over time, this will come under pressure. Uh, we inter we have introduced quite very successfully um, uh, an element of telephone investigation and telephone resolution on the side of our contact management centres. We find that that's an efficient way of doing that. We also find it has a high satisfaction amongst the people who are reporting crime to get things dealt with quickly and in a professional manner. And we will be able to look at, over time, how much of that other service we deliver in different ways, whether it's by putting back the call to a time when there are police available or by dealing it on the phone. And actually, the, the, the member of the public who's dialing in uh, also has uh, you know, an input into that as to what an appropriate service delivery looks like. And these things aren't cast in stone either. So, for somebody coming home and finding a, an old language, a two by two window frame cracked maybe by a stone, for some people that is neither here nor there, and they want to call the police, let them know, take a crime reference number and get it fixed under insurance. But if you're an 85 year old woman living on their own with no family, that's a crisis. Uh, and, the, and the police tasking uh, and understanding of that and response to it uh, is designed to meet both those, those, uh, those outcomes. Okay. Um, so I've had a couple of queries. Uh, you know, some. I think maybe this is one for later, but there has been a um, surge of fake news, social media hysteria, everybody, there's a lot going on on social media <coughs> and a lot of concern out there that re you know, emergency services will not be able to respond um, about certain areas that emergency services would be deployed in this um, in a potential lockdown or there's going to be you know, police officers standing outside Tesco's or there's going to be things like that. Um, I don't expect you to be able to answer um, that, but if you got a house call and it was a domestic violence situation and say there was isolating going on, yes. would you be able to de deploy to that house? Uh, yes, and we already have done so. Um, and, uh, you know, it's not the service that changes, it's the precautions that we take. Um, the police service have many years uh, of practice of, of delivering a routine policing service in incredibly difficult circumstances. All we've done is change how we do it. Um, but uh, we, have, we have responded to cases just such as that uh, over recent days. It has been identified as a COVID risk by the control room uh, and the appropriate crew with the appropriate equipment in an appropriate manner has been, has been responded and dealt with it as we would. Finally, Chair, in terms of the emergency coronavirus bill, has PSNI fed into any of the regulations that may be coming forward in Westminster? 
Yes, there's been full consultation uh, on, from the department to us, and we've had a full opportunity to make our views on <coughs> the pieces that are relevant. Not, 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 not large amounts of relevant completion, but we have been asked for a view and fed that in accordingly. Thank you. Um, have you seen that legislation yet? I've seen the parts of it that are relevant to policing, Chair, as I understand it, but I've not seen the wider legislation. We'll, we'll get an update, uh, hopefully on Monday, but um, one of the questions I suppose we'll be having is, are our organisations satisfied with what's in that legislation, that that's meeting your request, or are there things that you're being asked to do that you don't actually want to be included? So, um, it's actually, for us, um, we have a, a wide range of powers as a police service. What, what I see from the policing aspect of the, of the proposed legislation, it's actually it's a health ask, not a policing ask. Health are looking for particular measures they can use to control the spread of the virus where they may need, may need help from partner regions, including policing. If that's what the health service are asking for, uh, and that helps us help health, then I'm happy in that space. Okay. It is the issue, um, because I have had some people um, previous experience of the domestic abuse issue that Rachel had mentioned, uh, and they have said that there is a concern because a lot of these incidences sadly arise at Christmas time whenever you're in the home, and that there's a, a concern among, from some that this self-isolation with families um, could lead to increased difficulties in that area. Is that an issue that has been considered? It's an expectation, Chair, uh, in placing. Um the detective superintendent behind me, who will be talking to you later, was in the Belfast Telegraph. We've been interviewed on this yesterday. We're very clear. You know, it's it's it doesn't need to be inevitable. Yeah. But we are working on a working assumption that if people are in confined spaces uh, with people that they don't normally spend 24 hours a day with, mm -hmm. with the added stresses of mortgages, pay, employment, family members, elderly relatives, I don't think anybody in this room doesn't think that's going to increase people's stress levels. Yeah. And I don't think there's anybody in this room doesn't think that those increased stress levels won't have the potential to play out into, into domestic situations. That's our working assumption, and we're planning accordingly. Yeah, I think that's a fair comment. Gordon? Thanks, Chair, and thanks very much, gentlemen, for the information. Uh, Alan, the, the number, is that the 101 number you're talking about, the response team, the strategic response team, and how you've changed that? Is that what we're talking about? No. Um, well. All our contact management, uh, Gordon, under 999 and 101, are all managed by the one con contact management centre. So we were asking additional, qu whoever rings the police on whatever number have been asked additional questions to help us understand as to whether there may be anybody who has covert related condition before we respond to that call. Uh, so it's, it's just additional questions we ask when we're talking to the person. And is that civilians that are answering those calls? Uh, those are police staff who, who so. answer those, uh, fully trained police staff. Uh, who have a script of questions that they do the risk assessment model with. They're overseen by supervisors, and we've just added the, the, the COVID piece, uh, and that's overseen by... You still uh, ask the date of birth? We do, Gordon, and I, and I know that's, a, that's an issue for some people. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and I think yes, it is. Mr. It McGlone is. and I have had a conversation about this. Is that right? Uh, there, there, is, um, there is just a simple truth that because of the police database and all the other databases that we plug into across UK and Europe, People are identified by their name and their date of birth. It helps us very quickly identify who you are on the police system and what other information we have. It helps us deliver quick service to you. Um, and I know people, I know it causes some angst, but I, I reassure people that the only reason for it is it helps us identify you, your previous contact with the service, and any other links to our system that we might require to help our police, serv our, our police service deliver service to you. And if it wasn't necessary, I wouldn't do it. Good. The, um Local police and teams that we've certainly seen an, an uptick and an uplift yes. in the presence, sure. especially in our North Down area, and we welcome that. Are we likely to see a, a change in, in their availability in the next, next few weeks? The, the short answer to that, Gordon, is yes. Uh, it's, it's hard to, to judge, but you know, the, the working assumptions come out of central government are saying that any large organisation mm -hmm. could be looking at an attrition rate of somewhere around 30 or 35 percent of their staff at any one get time mm -hmm. at the height of the infection rates. Uh, and I, I, it would be disingenuous for me to sit in front of this committee and say if you take 35 percent out of the police service in Northern Ireland's capacity that you'll continue to see your neighbourhood teams out on the street because we've gone to extreme lengths to create an extra 400 posts in neighbourhood policing. But I'm, what I'm going to have to do in district policing for the next three to four months is consolidate local policing teams, neighbourhood policing teams, district crime teams into a pool, potentially put them on an emergency shift pattern so that we have the right number of police officers to go to calls for service and make that first. If the attrition rates are lower and that stress isn't as high as predicted, 
And clearly, I want to put people to the neighbourhood duties because that's that's a key piece in reassurance at stressful times. Mm -hmm. But at minus 35 percent of that, if that comes out for us and our partners, it would be disingenuous to pretend that it would be business as usual. Yeah, so we're back to response policing, really. And I, when we talk about going back to, to, to core service delivery, it starts with, you know, the, the principal reassurance that we give the public is when you ring us and you need us, we can get to you. Yeah. And that's response policing. And, and if we suffer those sorts of uh, absence rates, then that will have to lead our mm. business. That's that middle strand that I talked about earlier about responding to calls for service and reassuring and protecting the public, protected by our investigative piece on one side and our specialist capabilities on the other. Uh, and those are the sort of three tranches as I look at the business. Okay. And you're satisfied, you've already mentioned, I suppose, the point about um, where you're called to a home where the family are isolated or your, your staff are competent in, in dealing with that, those cases? The staff are competent uh, and we're putting as much help and, uh, and guidance around us. These, these things are an art more than a science, of course, um, and there will be many people isolating who actually are, are isolating out of um, you know, being conservative. Yeah, so, yeah. um, and this goes to, you know, w w without testing, you don't know, your staff are unsure of their own circumstances and uh, as are the public. So making judgments around that, they are judgments and they're risk-based judgments, but they are as much where they are. There's a, there's a significant amount of science in it, but there's also some art in that. So um, we try to treat that on a case-by-case -case basis. But what I'm confident in is we have the skills and the ability to do the right thing in, in the circumstances and continue to deliver the best service we can. These are obviously very unusual circumstances and far from the norm. So you know we appreciate that it's going to be difficult to meet all, all the taskings. I think the challenge, um, policing and, and, and partners and, and, and agencies aren't used to crises. Uh, it's the scale of this and the length of time for which it will continue, um, because that builds into resilience. And you know, you, we're working at pace. I think that's been mentioned a lot around this table. But working at pace over time uh, is, puts a, a significant amount of strain on our people, uh, and we have to protect against that. What about resources? Just. <coughs> The vehicles and so on, have any additional vehicles been acquired or all I, vehicles? Is your high rate of service for vehicles? Has it been increased? I, I don't assess that the, the vehicles are a critical issue for us, uh, but we are looking critically at that. Um, clearly, if you if you lose 30 per cent of your staff, that's 30 per cent of your maintenance goes well. But if you, if you <coughs> act your business to using and doing what you need to do, and downgrading the stuff that you don't need to do, then you focus the vehicles into those places where they're needed. So uh, the same goes for vehicles as, as goes for the rest of our approach to our business. Um, but uh, in terms of the wider resourcing picture, per, uh, personal protection equipment remains my principal concern. Um, not all of our officers have all of the kit in all of our places at all of the times. Uh, that's because of huge global demand and a reduction in global supply. Um, this was raised by the Chief Constable yesterday at Civil Contingency Group for Northern Ireland, chaired by First Minister and Deputy First Minister, which the Ministers were present. So it has been taken to the Executive Office by the Chief Constable at that level and made sort of, well, just made the number one priority because that links then to the confidence and reassurance of officers, which in turn links to their ability to deliver service to the public. So you are awaiting supplies, really? And uh, urgently? Urgently. Uh, and that's, uh, that puts <coughs> us in the same place as the prison service, the health service. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, anecdotally, you, you'll pick this up right across the health service as well. Having the, having the right equipment in all the places, so, and that's why we've gone to focused resources so that the kit that I have is in the places that it's most likely to be needed and most likely to be effective. Um, because, and, I'm say, and I've been honest with my chief constable and uh, our accountability structures and my staff that I don't have kit for everybody in every place in Northern Ireland at this point in time. I wish I did. But while, whilst we don't, are we looking to try and to ensure that what I have is used in the best places where it's needed, uh, and that's done in a guided and risk-managed way? Okay, we wish you well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Gordon. Paul. Thank you, Chair. Um, here, I'll not leave you out. Um, so, talk to us about a just level of activity within the courts. Uh, again, I, today I had went through what I would call a pre uh, appeal meeting with the constituent who's up for appeal next week. Uh, and we've probably we've advised her that we'll probably will be postponed. But you did talk about going to a paper system. That does worry me slightly because what I've found with appeals is it's the power of the person telling their story. 
that gets them through, along with their medical evidence, of course. Uh, and there's something in paper that just can't get that across. No, I, I don't have any issue with that. And, and uh, are you talking about a, a benefits a appeal? A yeah. Appeal, sorry, yes. The the, the arrangements within uh, the appeals tribunal uh, already provide for both oral and written appeals, and all we're doing is continuing to build on that. But in all cases, nothing will be done without the agreement of the the appellant. Um, yeah. So, so if if they feel strongly that that they would be disadvantaged by a paper based process, they're they're not obliged to agree to it, and it won't be imposed upon them. It's bound to be the case because a lot of the appeals panel don't want to go to a written appeal. I, I've had a number have come back to me to know that the constituent wanted a written before I was involved, and then I would have been advising no go for the oral. And even the panel would say we don't want to see this in written. We want to see the person. And that bounces back to that way. So, uh, but having said that, a, a majority, <coughs> the majority of the people who are going forward for appeals are vulnerable, who may well have to be isolated, isolating themselves. So there's that two-edged sword in this. And it is. It's trying to strike that balance. I mean, I, I appreciate that a, 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 an oral hearing or being in front of the panel allows allows you to tell your story better, uh, and it also allows the panel to to assess the individual better. Um, and, and yes, that, that will still, still be a, a key feature of the system. I think what the President is trying to achieve is, is a, a blended model which will allow important cases to go ahead. So some individuals, while they're waiting for their appeal to be determined, <coughs> will be financially disadvantaged. And, and it's trying to make sure that that's minimised. Uh, Alan, on to you. Uh, you talked about emergency shift patterns if you, had, if you lose some of your establishment, some of your numbers. Uh, what does an emergency shift pattern look like to your members? So, um, I, when I say emergency, it's, it's a technical term more than, a, a, than a, an, an, an imposition on people. But you know, our our demand will change, has is changing, Paul. Um, you know, if pubs and clubs are closed, then your nighttime economy demand isn't there. Our current shift system doubles up teams on a Saturday, Friday, and Saturday night in the expectation of an evening economy. That's counterintuitive to put twice as many cops in briefing rooms on a Friday and Saturday night if you don't need them in a time when we're trying to socially distance people. Um, so when you put that into one space, we're probably likely to go much... Your demand, instead of being peaked around evening economies and other things, mm -hmm. if that flattens into an all, uh, pretty much a steady line, we'll probably just go to a more steady shift system without the overlaps. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's not emerging in the case that it, it doesn't automatically require more working from people, but it does give us more flexibility. Um, and it also removes some of the no point having twice as many people on when you need them when actually you're short in other places. So might, might, might go from five shifts to four, might go from ten hours to eight. Um, it also helps us add flexibility to people who may have childcare arrangements or you've, uh, you've police officers manage other, married to other police officers and they want to work opposite shifts so that they can do childcare. All those sorts of things are more easily managed in a flat shift system potentially. Uh, and I have a team which should have proposals with me tomorrow for sign off on Monday. Um, but we're f working fully with staff associations, police federation, uh, uh, and officer uh, representatives to make sure that that's because part of it's designed to be user friendly for the police officers. Sure. Mm. Now, your organisation is much more than just frontline police officers. Yes. Who, who should be on the key workers list? Um, it's not a question I've been asked. Uh, because when when I heard the announcements from uh, from London, it was almost like police officers. It's a category, and you qualify. I've not been asked to segment that, and it's difficult to do that because, you know, I, I know my, my I know my detective colleagues in, in in crime branch, for instance. If I asked them to stand up 300 officers back into uniform to help, you know, then so, and actually, major investigations are no less important than the stuff we do in the street, and in many cases more important. Uh, and equally, firearms teams, search teams, and everything else. You can't run a murder investigation with a search team. You can't go to knife incidents with an armed response unit. So. Those three, those three tranches, it's, it's quite transferable and it's hard to segment that operational piece. And on the police staff side, you know, the people who are custody detention officers, the people who work in the contact management centres, they make our business work. So it's not just officers, it's also our police staff. Uh, you, you talked a wee bit about societal patterns changing, yes. nighttime economy. Uh, and that's one I haven't thought about because thinking just as you're speaking there, that we could have reduced crime levels for a wee period. You'll certainly get. I think you'll get a crime reduction, as particularly as as you go into more and more people not been on the streets. Yeah. You know, you can expect some traditional demand for policing, like road traffic collisions, drink driving, shoplifting. The shops aren't open. You know, but then in, in certain areas you get peaks where.
people don't have any money, so you get acquisitive crime. So I, I, you know, I think we understand what some of the likely trends and issues are likely to be. How it actually translates, we so just over time. That's my last question, then, Chair. Is, is how are you monitoring and measuring societal patterns to preempt surge? Uh, that's panic buying nonsense. Sure. One example. So. Or is that something you're worried about monitoring, keeping an eye on? I, I, I wouldn't want to talk it up and, and make it worse than it is, uh, but clearly you'd expect me to have a weather eye to that, and it's something we watch on a daily basis. We have, we're well plugged into the retail groups, uh, with lots of contacts through their representative bodies. We watch what's happening elsewhere. You sort of have a bit of a, you know, Italy, France, Germany have been two, three, four weeks ahead of us. You, you know, so that gives us a bit of a feed into that. All cultures are different, for sure. Um, but that's why that, that third tranche of support capability, that's where my public order people sit, that's where my armed response units sit. And we may get to the point where we're doing profile or prevention around particular places where we think we have particular problems or are likely to have so, just to help our partners and reassure and calm that situation. Okay, thank you, Jim. Okay, thank you. you. Pate? Yep. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, Doug. Pate and then Doug. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry, I was looking at Doug, just to make sure he still wanted in. <laughs> We're getting mixed up here. <laughs> so, um, now, thanks very much, but the first question is for yourself there, Peter, and it's picking up on what Paul said there, uh, and that's the whole issue of the appeal tribe. Now, some of the venues that you, that the appeal service would be using, like council offices, have now a policy of um, non-access to the public, so the decision has been made for you. But it's back to that original point. The stats and the figures are there that paper hearings are less likely to be successful for the appellant than oral hearings for two reasons. One is the person presents themselves and the, the panel are able to interrogate them is the wrong word, but question them in a nice way as, as most pa panel members do. But the second thing is <clears throat> they also have access to the person's clinical notes and medical records from their GP practice which very, very often in those cases that have been overturned is because the panel has access to detailed information about the person's health and well-being and disabilities that otherwise weren't available to BIP or CAPITA and wouldn't be because of data protection issues. So it's just that difference. It's a significant one between the, the um, success of a paper hearing and the success of an oral hearing. And, it, uh, and there's, there's a balanced judgment there of natural justice, a uh, principle of natural justice for, for people. I'm sure many, many people wouldn't want to go into a situation where potentially they could be exposed, especially people, many of whom that we would be representing, have underlying uh, medical conditions and disabilities where um, exposure to the coronavirus would really be very difficult to them, particularly if they have autoimmune disorders and all those types of things that many people who, who are eligible for the, the uh, children for the DLA and other people for PIP and uh, Tinsland. So it's just to make that point. Yeah, no, that's fine. And as I said to Paul, I mean, my understanding is that there isn't, it, it's not intended to impose any particular solution mm -hmm. on, on an individual yes. appellant. It will, it will still be a matter of choice. Um, and, and those issues will be, be taken into account as we move forward. The other point you made was about access to medical records, and yes, I appreciate yes. that as this continues, um, the, the ability of surgeries to produce medical records, will, will, it'll not be a priority mm -hmm. for them. There are, however, a block of cases which are already in the system, which, which we can continue to, to progress, so for it, it, that should <coughs> wait for a while. That's Grant, thank you, and then I'll move over to, your, to yourself, Alan. <clears throat> As you know, when we're dealing with people, there's many people, there's older people, there's children at home, there's people who are facing under hardships, and there's difficulties and pressures for many people, and will be increasingly so as, as this goes on. Um, in terms of your leader within the community and within the police, what message of reassurance during a public forum here today would you give to society in relation to that bit of making f feel people are giving them a, a sense or a feeling of reassurance and, and a bit more calm. Sure. So, um, and thank you for the opportunity, uh, Patsy, around that. I mean, I think all the feedback that we get across all of this is that people have confidence in policing when they, when you, when you can give them reassurance that when they ask you, ask for you, or you need them, that will be there for them. So I can give people that reassurance that when people need the police service, they'll be there for them. 
Um, and this this talk of prioritisation and all, you know, it's just another way of doing the business. But it, but we will be there for them. We will absolutely be prioritising that safeguarding role that understands the vulnerabilities and stresses of the of the current situation. Uh, and we'll be making sure that we ident identify that at the front end. And that goes back to my win broken window piece earlier. We absolutely understand how we tailor our service to meet the. <coughs> The, the concerns of the most vulnerable uh, in society, mm -hmm. and and any any sense I give the committee round about us taking stuff off the outside edge is to is to maintain my core capability to do that. So uh, that is that's the undertaking we give the public. You know we will go the extra mile to make sure that when you need us, we'll be there. Yes, and um, as I heard, Dylan Ato was in a supermarket and. Um, one of the ladies was telling me that there were people, police had to be called, um, because people were fighting over bottles of water hmm. uh, whenever it's coming out of the skies. Um, so <laughs> I think <laughs> all you have to do is go and fill it up at the top. Yep. So um, there are silly things going on, and you, police service doesn't need to be distracted yes. into that silly sort of stuff. Um, perhaps I could come on to the um, a number of sort of practical measures within within your workforce. Um, have you done an audit? This is no, in the interest of the well-being of the workforce. We talked earlier about the exposure, and Rachel raised the issue of the exposure of going into a situation, perhaps a domestic, where somebody's yes. self-isolating, yes. and you're unaware of that, yes. and not made aware of it, yes. and all those sort of things. But what I'm looking at is the, the wider workforce that you have. Mm. Um, have you done an audit of, again, there will be people within the workforce who have susceptibilities, yes. who have vulnerabilities, who may have autoimmune disorders of one variety or another, but nevertheless are an integral part of the workforce. But ha has the PSNI done an audit of those people, their needs and requirements? There will be some who will be able to work from home, there will be others who yes. won't, but to make sure just that they aren't placed in a difficult position in terms of exposure to the virus. So. Um the short answer is no, we don't have an audit of the workforce, mm -hmm. uh, Patsy. Um, and we had this discussion maybe three or four weeks ago about what our approach would be on the front end of this. The weakness in trying to do the audit of the workforce is you don't, as an employer, routinely have access to all the persons mm -hmm. medical. It sort of goes across to the question that Peter answered earlier about tribunals. Mm -hmm. You know, we will have a record through our occupational health and welfare of the issues they have brought to us as an organisation for help with, but that doesn't. There's another half of that about what's, what are they doing with their GP, what treatment have they had, what hospital admissions they had. And I know there's an ask from us as a service. There is an Northern Ireland Clinical Records Access System, uh, which I would like to be available to our clinicians uh, yeah. to help them make those judgments. But to start from scratch and do a health assessment of 10,000 people size organisation, uh, we just felt was unachievable within our resource. And actually, you wouldn't have half the information required to complete it. So. The short answer to that is no, which is why we've gone to the approach, as I mentioned earlier, about setting out the guidelines, telling people the criteria using the public health guidelines, not our guidance, the public health guidelines, that's what they are. If you feel you're in this category, talk to your line manager. Once you've talked to the line manager and flagged it, we'll do an assessment from there. That's grand. That's okay. Thank you. Notwithstanding that, we do understand the demographics of our workforce. So when you look at the age and spread of the workforce, we will understand roughly how many people will have older parents, how many people will have younger children, yes. and that plays into our overall assessment of the global number that we're likely to have off at any one time. Yeah, that's grand. Um, there's one other thing um, that I'd like to, to suggest to you. I had a conversation with, with an officer the other day, and that's, okay, um, in, in a situation, we'll call it that, um, the first point of call will be to ring the police or the ambulance, whatever it might be, um, if police don't show or one on one isn't properly working or somebody's just a wee bit slow in reacting to that, inevitably, in many cases, the second point of call will be the public representative. Now, I'm very fortunate in that Superintendent Mike Baird and Chief Inspector Mervyn Seffin mm -hmm. are excellent at getting back to you. Mm -hmm. I've even had them coming back to me whenever they were on holidays way overseas <laughs> just to check the thing. That's, I'm not. I'm not exaggerating, that's, that's true. However, um, there will be other cases and other instances where it could be a councillor, it could be some elected representative won't be able to get through. Have you considered, um, hotline is maybe the wrong word, but um, more joined up connectivity to make sure that if, if one person is off on leave, potentially maybe off sick, um, that their mobile 
is diverted to another mobile that someone will pick up on. We're working through a whole background about because we will be looking at additional absence from the workplace. Yes. So we're looking at what the implications that are for connectivity and for continuity of business. I don't have all the answers around that because we're still working that through. I would say because you know you said this is a forum for reassuring the public. Um, whilst people will have a view on 101, I would remind them it's a non-emergency number. Mm -hmm. And at a time like this, our priorities is emergency. And I can tell you, you know, hand on heart, we do 96 or 97 percent of our 999 mm -hmm. calls are answered within 30 seconds. Um, we're one of the Actually, we're probably the top performing police service in the United Kingdom in terms of how we answer 999 calls and respond to emergencies. And I think that's an important reassurance message for the public. Mm -hmm. okay. Right, thanks very much. Thanks, okay, Chair. Dick. Well, thanks, Chair. Um, I'll, I don't envy you, I've got to say. I mean, we are in a, a really trying times, and, and you're on the front line of this. And I don't think anybody knows where we're going to end up at the end of this. But I think. You know, um, your officers do a, a, an incredible job, and, and I guess there's who owns the risk of what, what's going to happen in the future. Does the risk sit with you as an ACC? Does it sit with the Chief Constable? Does it sit higher than that uh, in regards to your officers? But I'm looking at some of the police powers they're talking about bringing in in this pandemic bill, uh, and, and some of them are frightening, I, I've got to say. Uh, and I, when I say frightening, they're, 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 they're frightening in their scope, um, because I don't think the infrastructure is there to bring them in and give you those powers people can give you the powers but there's, there's no outlet for them so i'm just reading one of the powers uh, the bill will enable the police and immigration officers to detain a person for a limited period who is or may be infectious and take them to a suitable place to enable screening and assessment um, so the question would be where is that suitable place for the screening and assessment hmm. and, and what happens when you bring them there do you have to stay with them do they are they then detained or, i mean have you got any light to that have you had any so, I mean, I, I appreciate the nervousness. I'm a little bit nervous when I read the text myself, but I, but I am reassured when I talk it through with my people and my practitioners. You know, this this audience and the wider audience should be assured that the principles of policing don't change. We're a human rights uh, compliant organisation. We have significant levels of accountability through this and other functions in the policing board, uh, not notwithstanding the, the internal stuff. The Ombudsman's Office sits off to one side as well. So there's a good accountability framework around it. And there's a good values-based decision-making model, human rights-based at the, at the middle of we do. So the powers you're referring to are instigated and, 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 and actually done by the police at the request of the health service. So if the health service haven't asked to me, those would be the questions I'll be asking in order to retain our human rights compliance around our policing services. And I'll be saying, what is it you want done? Why is it proportionate? Where are the facilities? Is that workable? Because, the, because it is a request. It is a request of service from a statutory partner. Um, and I will be applying the values of the police service and the human rights uh, considerations of the police service in our decision making. Uh, it means we have the power. It doesn't mean we have to use it. Yeah. We know it means we have the power. It doesn't mean it be appropriate in all circumstances. But I can also reassure the committee that we're very practiced in working with partners and in, in interoperability across a wide range of peace. And this is well practiced by, by our front line. And, and you know, I can understand why you have those dedicated police groups for dealing with. COVID-19 cases absolutely makes perfect sense. But what about proactive policing? What about proactive policing if you decide to do a search for whatever reason um, and you then go in and suddenly realise that the house you have gone into uh, is in isolation? Do you think we should have uh, mandatory notification? Um, do you think that would help um, with, with well, all of the issues, but certainly we're talking justice here, but would mandatory notification help with justice, or with policing, sir? I think it would be great to know. Um, you know, if you look at the Chinese situation and the app and the traceability and the knowledge that the state have of where citizens are, I can absolutely see the serviceability of that. I don't think for a second it's going to happen in, in a liberal democracy such that we practice and the police service that we deliver. So, you know, uh, I just don't think we're ever going to get to that space. Um, so, uh, as ever, uh, and... Um, you know, you asked a question earlier. I mean, regardless of the of the legal fine points around it, it's my role as a goal commander to assume responsibility for my decision making. It's all recorded on a daily basis on 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 my goal decision making log. It's there to be accountable. It's there to be responsible when it comes back, and and it's there to be to be held account for. And I don't take those lightly. But I have the utmost confidence in my people, uh, who on a daily basis will go to a call to find out that. There's a firearm in the house that shouldn't be there, or isn't legally held, or isn't notified, or there's, you know, 
we routinely do drug searches in this country where we find fentanyl, which is a hugely dangerous chemical. Sometimes we know it's there, that's fine. Sometimes we don't. But we are very adaptable, uh, very risk aware and very professional. Uh, and at some point, uh, the, the scope and, uh, and, and uh, control of the Assistant Chief Constable has to say, I have put everything in place, but I have the utmost confidence and ability of my people to do the right thing on the ground. Uh, and, and if we do the modelling, um, I'll, and, and again, I, I fully appreciate we're just talking worst case scenarios. If we do the modelling and we're talking about 60% of our working population could well be either uh, have the disease or, or isolating or isolating because they're fear of getting the disease. And that will replicate itself in all aspects, including our police force. So yes. the PSNI could have about 60% of its workforce who are sick scared of getting sick or self-isolating. Self um, so police resilience becomes an issue. Has there been any thought given to the return of retired police officers in order to fill the, maybe the not the frontline roles, but maybe some of those other roles to, to free up officers? So it's a consideration uh, under the National Police Chiefs Council in England and Wales and Scotland. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been asked to contribute to that conversation. I think the emerging position, and it's, I'm, I'm not there to speak for them, nor or indeed have we refined a position on it, the difficulty with retired officers is you would, in whatever role, um, there's the employment regulations around it, uh, and that would have to be set to one side, frankly, because it's it's not compliant with uh, with uh, employment regulations. There'd be retraining, significant risk assessment people, uh, places. They're also heading into the age demographic that makes them higher in risk, um, and there are a lot of things associated with that. And actually, there are probably easier ways to get the capability than go that route with it. That's just my assessment at this point in time. These things are clearly open to review, but we have we have no plans or, and aren't formulating plans at this point in time to do that. And that's what takes me all the way to the start: is who owns the risk on this? Sure. You know, you know, somebody has to own that, that risk. Um, you know, and and, uh, and and is that the Westminster government or is that chief constables who have to own the risk when they have to make these? Well, there were conversations yesterday uh, which the chief constable elevated through the civil contingencies group for Northern Ireland uh, with with all the ministers in the room, um, because we do think it's a shared risk. Um, so I've touched, and I won't labour the point around the availability of protective equipment to first-line responders. Uh, you've touched with other partners in the room earlier around the issue of testing. So there isn't the capacity to test healthcare workers at the moment. Um, and when that capacity increases, healthcare workers will be the priority for that. But we would see ourselves as, in fact, the police service is the only category one responder under civil contingencies for Northern Ireland. Uh, and the notion that you wouldn't include the blue light services in the wider testing regime is something we don't accept. Uh, and the chief made this point very clearly to uh, your ministerial colleagues yesterday uh, and senior civil servants. Um, you also raised the piece about you know, testing of people who, who are unwell. Well, the situation at the minute is unless you're hospitalised, you won't be tested. So people in self-isolation aren't being tested. And even when there are any symptoms they have, and it could be a common cold pass, they can come back to work and then be infected. And this is where the confusion about reinfection comes. Well, it may have been COVID-19 you had the first time. If you're not tested, you don't know. So that space, that testing space for reassurance and confidence of my officers and staff and their ability to do their role. Uh, but also, uh, you know, that's a pretty big piece of our ask to government because we don't think that's, that's a risk that needs to be owned, should be owned by Chief Constable. That needs to be a wider political ownership of that. Um, and it, it's, a, it's going to be, I think, a key success factor. Because my people will get ill. Most of them, the vast majority of them, will recover and come back to work. But the testing gives you reassurance and confidence around that. In fact, you know, if you had a significant number of people over time having and gained immunity, it actually takes the risk off the front line responding to further calls. But testing informs my ability as Assistant Chief Constable to make decisions around that. And that's why, for us, it's the equipment and the testing are probably the two biggest asks from policing in terms of how the wider system supports us in, in doing the job we have to do. And I'm, and I'm getting up from a lot, and I'm sure everybody's getting up from a lot of corners, Alan. You're absolutely right. Test, test, test seems to be the way to mm -hmm. do this, to, to have a better understanding uh, of where this is. Listen, thanks very much. Uh, you know, uh, it's really a difficult time. But, but very briefly, Peter, if I can, one of the key roles that we wanted from the, the justice um, was to speed up justice. Um, but we're now in a position here where I guess that's not going to happen. Justice is going to slow down again, um, maybe even slower than what it was because of, of no jury trials. So, so can I ask then, um, clearly we have lots of people who are on remand. So before they get a trial, it's going to be extended further now. 
Um, is the bail guidelines being reviewed, relaxed, changed? Is there more criteria going for bail? To uh, that, that will be an issue that the, the Chief Justice is, is considering uh, in terms of what he needs to issue to his, his colleagues. Um, one of the things I mentioned in the opening statement was about you know, taking account of time spent on remand against the, the likely sentence, um, and again, that could be a factor when considering applications for bail. Uh, but you're right, I mean, the, 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 there's no doubt that this will impact on, on performance of the justice system for a long time. Uh, across courts and tribunals, we would deal with approximately 100,000 cases per, per annum. Uh, and the longer this goes on, the more challenging the recovery plan is going to be to, to develop and deliver. Um, and, and I think that that's something that we, we have an eye on uh, looking to the future. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, we're, we're going to be moving just into to closed session now. Just before I do that, I think it's right that I put on record my appreciation for what the Department of Justice is doing, the police service, the prison service. You know, there are decisions being taken that normally you would process over weeks, months, maybe even years, and you're having to do that in hours. And so I don't for one minute underestimate the pressure that uh, those services are under and the individuals and leadership that are having to take and the members of your staff that are having to go out and face these challenges as many people want to go and shelter themselves from it. There are people in our community stepping up to take it on head on, and that's something that I hugely admire. And I think it's right that we, as a committee, acknowledge that and say that publicly uh, for what you're doing, and commend you for it. And you'll have our support in the the period ahead. And I, I want to thank members for the very mature and calm way that they've asked questions, and for the professionalism by which uh, the the members have provided those answers to us. So, on that, uh, I'm going to move now into the closed session. Northern Ireland Assembly, Committee Room 30. Northern Ireland Assembly, Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Committee Room 30. Okay, members, um, we'll reconvene again in public session and we'll move to item 10, which is the budget key issues. Uh, the RIA's research paper on committee engagement on 2020-21 departmental budget planning was noted by the committee at the meeting on the 20th of February, and it was agreed that further consideration would be given to it at a future meeting. Um, the Minister of Finance intends to announce the Northern Ireland Budget 2021 uh, on the 30th of March, after which this committee will expect to have more detailed engagement with the Department of Justice on its budget position. There are a number of key themes and issues, including many of those that have been identified in the research paper. They have been set out in the clerk's memo, which is on page 160 of your pack, um, and uh, it would be useful to refer to these to the Department in preparation for future discussions on the budget and the expectation that information on these issues should be, provide, be provided in a written budget briefing papers uh, that will come from uh, the Department. So I am asking just at this stage. If members are content that we forward the list of issues to the Department of Justice, uh, ask that they are addressed in the forthcoming written briefing papers on the 2020-21 budget, um, and appreciate that uh, issues have already taken over in terms of the coronavirus and, and what way the executive has to address that in terms of its own financial expenditure. Um, as Mr. Frew indicated earlier, so far all of this. Money is being distributed from Barna Consequentials to do with the coronavirus, and the executive, I've no doubt, will be looking now at their own spending plans and how that needs to be uh, configured appropriately. Um, so we, we'll forward that on um, as outlined. Chair, I think a very specific question should be asked of them as to how they are going to. Uh, I think we're into a new place now with regards to the budget, uh, not necessarily just this department, but the whole budget, the whole executive's budget, and the planning for the, the virus and the economic shock and everything else that comes with it and the recovery. Mm -hmm. This is going to be a budget like no other. Mm -hmm. It really is that stark. And I think the specific question we should ask is, what are you going to peg back? What are you going to stop doing in order to get money into the centre? Mm -hmm. uh, that's probably the question we have to pose. Yeah. What's going to be different? Well, undoubtedly, it's a changed environment. So. I think that goes without saying.
Okay, the, the Committee for Finance, uh, which Mr Frew, of course, is a member of, um, a very good one at that, has asked all statutory committees engage with their respective departments and participate in a standardised budget scrutiny process using a template developed by RAISE. The Committee um, has asked that this Committee agree to forwarding the template available to the Department for completion by 16th of April, provide a copy of the completed template to the Finance Committee, and raise whenever it's received back from the committee, schedule an oral evidence session with the Department of Justice officials at our meeting on the Thursday, the 23rd of April, and discuss and agree the committee position on the Department of Justice budget at the meeting on the 30th of April, and to send a copy uh, to the Department, the Finance Committee, and raise. So if members are content, uh, we'll action that. Uh, there may be some changes to it in light of current um, events, but nevertheless, uh, we'll action the issue as outlined. Content. Correspondence. There's eight items of correspondence. Um, I'll just draw attention to a couple. Item seven. There's a response from the Lord Chancellor and Secretary of State for Justice to the Committee's letter regarding the terrorist offenders, restriction of early release bill and the decision not to extend the provisions to Northern Ireland. Uh, the Minister of Justice has undertook in her letter uh, to the Committee back in February um, when further details of the proposed uh, provisions in the counter-terrorism bill are available that she would uh, write to us, which we're still uh, awaiting. So that information is there for members uh, to note, and I look forward to uh, further developments in terms of the uh, content of the letter from the Lord Chancellor and how it deals with the issues that we had raised. Item 8 is a memo from the Committee on Procedures seeking the views of statutory committees on current procedures for LCMs. Um, it's just to seek agreement for members to place the correspondence on the agenda for a future meeting uh, for a discussion on any views or issues that the committee may wish to draw attention to the uh, Committee on Procedures. So we'll make that uh, an item for a future meeting if members are content. Right. In the table pack, um, I'll just draw attention to one item. There's a copy of the report from uh, the Criminal Justice Inspector uh, for Northern Ireland and the follow-up review of its 2016 road traffic enforcement inspection. The report covers the proposal for a road traffic court that the committee included on its list of possible priority areas at the recent strategic planning session. Um, further consideration can be given to this particular area of the report when the committee discusses its priorities again in the future. And I'm just asking members to note this report at this stage, unless there's any further clarity members need. Otherwise, can I ask members uh, if you're content to action all the other items of correspondence as set out in the cover sheet? Agreed. Agreed, yeah. Chairman's business, uh, briefly, President of the Law Society has invited uh, I and the Deputy to meet with them and the Chief Executive to hear about their role, responsibilities and uh, Arrangements will be made in due course to facilitate that. There's a letter from the Community Rescue Service, um, page 324. Uh, again, um, I've received a letter from the Rescue Service uh, in respect of my and the Vice Chair's appointment, uh, highlighting the three-part documentary called The Search, in terms of the work the organisation carries out. Uh, and. At a future point, uh, it may be an organisation that would be useful for us to engage with, uh, and we'll seek to uh, do that at a future point. Any other business? Well, then, members, it's likely we'll have a meeting on Monday, and as soon as the arrangements are made, um, I'll advise, the clerk will advise members accordingly. Uh, okay. Meeting's adjourned. Thank you. Now, in Assembly Committee Room 30.